Hello, welcome. It's Hard Lore Time. How are you, Bo? So good. Can you believe this guest? I can't. Who do we got? I, I literally can't. Um, where to begin here? <laughs> Punk legend. Rancid. Lars Fredrickson and the Bastards. Old firm F and casuals. Yeah. Friend of the show. Uh, AEW music alumni. This is a. Uh, <laughs> this is destiny, being fulfilled here, really. Mm. Lars Fredrickson. The way you explained me sound like sounded like a Dio song. You know, it was very <laughs> positive and uplifting. All I needed to be is a dancer on a rainbow. Yeah, you right? are our exactly. rainbow in the dark. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're the dark. You're the rainbow. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, Lars. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. I'm I'm really excited to be here, and I'm, I'm and I'm finally excited to see that meme of me properly used. Mm. Thank you, dude. Because it's Go and that's like the third. Mm. Uh, not only are you the third uh, American skinhead. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> not no, only are you the 18th American skinhead. <laughs> Probably you are, you're definitely the third reaction meme. You, well, that it's see, that's the thing. When I first saw that, it was something about Mexican girls when they yell at you or something. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it said, like, it scared me, but it gave me a boner at the sure. same time. And I thought, that's pretty funny. That's pretty close. <laughs> um, you know, growing up with the, with the, in a Mexican neighborhood, uh, I couldn't understand it. But then this proper use of it, I was like, well, this is what this meme was meant for. Yeah. 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 Cause I know I, I, I do listen to the show and I know you guys are very funny and I, I'm very engaged when you guys do your thing. And I, and I think that's something that I, obviously that's why I'm here. Cause I wanted to be part of that, uh, you know, that environment. So I like yeah. having fun, you know mm. what I mean? We're going to get so into that. I don't know. I don't know if we're going to have much fun with Bo and his morose fucking attitude right now. But yeah, perfect. perfect. <laughs> oh, my God. We are. I mean, he's a little. My I'm man's got to lighten up. Lighten up a little bit, Bo. He's oh, lighting. no. I'm, I'm great. I'm dynamite. Okay. Bo, right. Bo, you, 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 I mean, Rancid is like your gateway band, right? Um, but, uh, Full transparency, I think. AFI would be the one, but like right. that is adjacent. That's like as adjacent as it gets. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, absolutely. But I didn't, you know, I don't know. I, Colin, I know you wanted to be chronological, chronological with this. Um, so I do, I do have questions and stuff leading kind of into, into that. So why don't, why don't you take it away? Colin, take us back sure. in time. Sure. Dad Brown. So Lars. Yes, sir. Rancid is like the gateway band, you know, when you break it down scientifically, 94, 95, what Rancid was doing around the world got mm. literally, this is like not an exaggeration, millions of people into hardcore and punk. Mm -hmm. I want to know who pioneers the pioneer. What mm. were your gateway bands? Uh, well, my brother was the one that brought home punk for the first time. A, a guy by the name of Sean Gregonis moved into the neighborhood around 78, 79. And he was like, you know, your traditional kind of like American, you know, skinhead punk rocker. He had like the, you know, an X shaved in his head, but his hair was super short for the band, you know, cause he was from San Luis Obispo, I think mm. originally. I remember seeing him walking down the street with a white t-shirt, rolled up jeans, and and uh, uh, paratrooper boots. <laughs> and this is before Doc Martens and all that stuff, you know? Right. And he was holding a boombox, and he was blasting, like, the Circle Jerks or something like that. I don't know, you know? Right. But that was, like, my first introduction to, like, the punk rock thing. And then my brother, because our neighborhood was very, it was low-income housing, so it was a lot of, like, poor kids. So, you know, you had, like, the Cholo. You had the Blacks, you had the Tongans and the Samoans. You had, there was three white families. There was the Baileys, there was us, and then there was Gregonis. 
who was the guy who brought the punk in. And he was related or somehow his dad was friends with these guys, the, the, another family called the Mahers. Mm. Um, that was the first introduction. My brother then getting into it and then the English stuff kind of kind of coming in brought the skinhead thing to it, right? Sure. Mm-hmm. And so the bands that I first got exposed to were like the Ramones, obviously. And then it was a lot, it was all the oi stuff, like Cockney Rejects, The Business, Blitz, Last Resort, Four Skins, Angelic Upstarts, uh, Infrariot, just like you know, you name an English punk band. That's kind of what was on the turntable. Then you had like bands like Social Distortion Mm -hmm. and then um, Kraut and uh, shit. I'm trying to think who else? Uh, China White. And then when the hardcore thing hit, that's when it like really kind of like took a turn really for all of us because that's when the music started to really change. You know, right. How many of those bands that you just named have you now worked with directly? (laughs) Well, Played shows, worked with probably 90%. (laughs) (laughs) And that's, dude, that's like, that's what this is for us now, you know? Right. Well, that's much respect. Of course. We're kind of jumping ahead, but one thing I did want to ask you about was one of my favorite series of, or like collections of videos are from the last Ramon show Mm -hmm. where like Lemmy comes out kind of last second and plays and you guys play a song. Um, Was that. How full circle, <laughs> how much more full circle could that have been, you know? Well, it was going to go on a little bit further, which is nobody really knows about this story. But um, it was it was a it was a crazy moment because I remember we went to the sound check to do that show. And it was after sort of all of our touring had been done because that was after mm-hmm. Lollapalooza. And uh, obviously, we both ended up on that tour. And Johnny was the one that said, hey, we're having a bunch of guests. Would you and Tim be able to, you know, be into playing 53rd and 3rd with us? Because they knew that was like my favorite Ramon song. Right. And uh, we were like, yeah. And then Johnny would go, do your thing. Do your rancid thing. Like, get up there and burn the fucking stage down like you guys do. And that's why we're running around like maniacs. Mm. Because we, when we initially were sound checking, we were just kind of standing there because out of respect. You know, yeah, of course, yeah, it's like of course. we're up there with the Ramones and Johnny's like, why are you guys fucking moving around? You know, <laughs> you guys do your fucking the ranted thing. You know, and we're like, OK, you know, it's, once they let the leash off, you know, and it was but it was like it was a pretty surreal moment. The, the thing that a lot of people don't know about is that we were going to go do South America with them and that we were, they were going to do a South American run after that last show. Wow. And. Because it wasn't technically the last show Mm -hmm. at the time. It became the last show, right? But apparently, you know, I, I, from this is from what I understand, maybe, maybe CJ or somebody who, and, or Marky might be able to, 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 uh, to elaborate. But from what I understand, Johnny called me and said, Hey, we're doing, we want to do South America. We want you guys to come with us. And this was in, it would have been in, uh, in, October of 1996, which we would have done this. But I guess something didn't come together or whatever. So I believe that's why that was the last show. So it was was retroactively decided that that was the last show? I think because it wasn't like we knew they're going, we knew going in that this was going to be the last show. Wow. Wow. I think we would have been told. And the thing about the Ramones is they would always be in the backstage, Marky, CJ, and Johnny. And they would play three songs before they would step up on the stage. So they'd be in there acoustically and just be playing together. And uh, I got pictures of it actually somewhere. I have to dig up a lot of these pictures. But <laughs> Here they um, are here. You'll see them right here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a pretty surreal moment, to, to be quite honest, because me and my brother, back in the 70s, before like cable TV, when it was first started to come out and hit our area, we had a, the, the cable company was called Gill Cable. Mm-hmm. And instead of like the four channels that you normally get, now you got 13 or 12 and 12 and 13 was the Gill Cable channel. Mm-hmm. They played rock and roll high school. And this is probably 79. So they played rock and roll high school 32 times in one month. And me and my brother looked in the TV guide 
that was how long ago it mm-hmm. was. And we would we would circle it and we would wake up no matter what time it was on, oh but we would wake God. up and watch the movie. And uh, cause that was, I mean, that was, you talk about the gateway, like the, that movie was kind of a gateway for me in a wow. lot of ways. And then Sean and it's, it was like the perfect storm of all the things that came in, you know? So it's like, I was just kind of at the right place at the right time in a weird way. Sean, uh, yeah. Like that's, that's, we talk about how like thanks lists and t-shirts get people into hardcore and punk, but like mm. rock and roll high school on the TV guide. <laughs> is that's nobody else is, is given that one so thank you wow, wow much respect. <laughs> yeah. but you know but that's a, a lot of the ways that i found out about bands like rose tattoo and how like people dressed you know because i mean we you know it's not like you had the internet back then so you you sort of like would see people at shows or you would look at the like you know like you were just saying backs of the records yeah but I saw Rose Tattoo being thanked on the first Oi record, and I was like, "Who's Rose Tattoo?" Right. And then that was. And a then whole the, other... they had the coolest art, so I'm sure you see Rose Tattoo art, and you're like, "Oh, I'm fucking. This yeah. is for me. <laughs> this is." I mean, favorite. and a lot of the reasons why, when you see rancid band photos, and we're kind of like, you know, very close and hugging each other, is is straight up, like, "Hey, let's do like Rose Tattoo Assault and Battery." You know Shirts what I mean? Like, off. I love yeah. that. That picture is incredible. The Rose it's Tattoo incredible. promo picture is like so perfect and awesome. Yeah. So yeah. I mean that's Rose Tattoo was also like a big influence and a lot not not a lot of people knew about, it, you know. So Right. You know, I mean I, I feel like it was that music was was pretty underground and when back then like you really had to want to be there like, because um you were going to get shit by everybody. Right. By school by the cop, the cops would random. I'm an 11 year old kid. Cops would randomly stop me, search me, and they would always do it like around five o'clock when it was prime drive time, and I'd yeah. be walking home from this so everybody could see. Because you look so you know, fucking badass, or what? <laughs> well, yeah, because I had you know I had a shaved head and I got boots, and yeah. you know it's like that's and even riding a skateboard. Like if you rode a skateboard, cops would be all over you. Get off the sidewalk, mm. and then you'd get out, and then you would go okay. And then you'd be starting to skate in the street. Get in the street, it's the car. You know, like they would fuck with you like that. <laughs> yeah. You know? And Where then do you want me, man? Come on. <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing. And then if you, like, talked back, of course, you knew what was going on. And they they, they didn't care. Right. They didn't care how old you were. You were just a freaky, you know, they would, you know, a little f- it, you know, they give you sure. that stuff. Yeah. Right? So not that I condone saying that word now, but you know what I mean? It's like. Yeah, of course. It, it, back then, you know, you were a Devo fat, first mm-hmm. of all, because they people were uneducated about it, and the Devo. jocks would Devo was Devo. the most subversive thing that they could think of <laughs> well, to yeah. to a jock. You know yeah, what I mean? Right, right, right. You're probably into the B fifty twos. You're a fucking Devo. Fat. You know that's wow. like that. That would be like the the thing that they would say. Right. You know, and you know, but where we were in the neighborhood, it was a pretty rough kind of neighborhood so and where was this? um this was in campbell california campbell so it was a pretty rough neighborhood and like i said you had like the cholos on one street the tongans up there you know everybody was kind of mixed and everybody was you know we Mars, all got I, along. I have a question i have a question this is a royal question this is a royal question to you guys let me know if you know the answer to this do okay. do racist guys hate samoans too do like do, do, like they'll beat your ass do you know like they should know to make an exception nobody's <laughs> fucking with samoans man well look at i you know <laughs> to the racist never, community if you're listening yes, yeah. you guys gotta <laughs> make an exception for samoans Christ. they're they'll beat your ass okay <clears throat> um anyway you know Anyways. i got <laughs> You know, I would never. It, my one of my best friends was this cat. He was from Tong. He was Tongan. It was Juby Thaili, and uh, we. That's where our, one of the one of the way. That was my first wrestling friend, mm. and um, that's kind of where we connected. You know, but like I said, we were all poor, and we were all kind of in that block, or you know the subs. You know the the streets kind of ran parallel to each other, 
So everybody was kind of cool, you know what I mean? It sure. wasn't, I mean, some of the, like, in that early hip-hop shit, they were kind of looking like us punkers. Mm-hmm. And they, they, I remember they would kind of look at us and being like, well, why are you wearing, like, studded belts or whatever? We had the, you know, the 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 um, the uh, the more cone studs, but they had, like, the pyramid studs the on their belts, stud, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Much more common now. Yes. So, but, I mean, you know, they liked street music you know that was the the street shit you know and we liked street music and we would get together and in you know drink 40s and smoke leños and fucking you know get high and get dusted and just you know wow. overall get crazy together but i will say that like uh you know the whole the race race and stuff i didn't really see that until i kind of later on in life you know mm-hmm. i didn't really understand that there was that thing there does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. You know, so but growing up in the Bay Area, we, you know, we were sort of the leaders of these cultural revolutions, whether it was through our sports teams, the Oakland Raiders or sure. Oakland Bays in the 70s. Like we were kind of sort of spearheading these cultural revolutions. So, and my mom, you know, obviously, you know, I've told this story many times, but she grew up in Nazi occupied Denmark in World War II. Wow. And saw like her family get killed in front of her and shit. You know what I mean? Like some, Whoa. some, some like real trauma, right. not just like you know I didn't get love from my daddy or whatever yeah, fucking yeah. trauma. Yeah. But anyways, like some real shit. And I think when she came to the states and she immigrated um, in '61, the final time, like you know she she brought a whole different, uh, I guess, culture for sure but a psychology around mm. like race, creed, color, religion, because she wasn't religious at all. And, but like, she understood, like, I think the moral compass that she tried to instill in me and my brother was like about accept everybody on their merit, not on, you know, the color or religion or sex sure. or whatever the fuck, you know, although, and I think that's one of the reasons why me and my brother did find punk because our household was very like European in culture. Mm -hmm. which means that like what kids my friends over here were talking about at the dinner table definitely wasn't what we were talking about. So you always felt kind of sort of separated from, you know, just what was there. And like all my friends growing up and since we were such in a multicultural neighborhood and stuff, there wasn't, there wasn't really any kind of race shit because we were all poor. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like, it's like, it didn't, that didn't really come into play. And I think with my mom being such like an advocate, you know, and had experienced, you know, sort of atrocity of war and yeah. of 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 um, sectarian kind of fucking shit, you know, mm. um, and just, you know, what she experienced. Like my, my my her brother was part of the Danish underground, you know, his that's where the old from Casuals record holder dance comes from oh, because man. he was part of that unit. So it's like. And they were smuggling, you know, people out of out of in front, into Denmark and out into like you know other places, England, mostly Ireland, some and and some Scotland, Scotland. But I, you know, this is all stuff I got before she died. But um, at the end of the day, I think just the way that my mom viewed the world was was a big major way that I ended up viewing the world. And I think that's my mom was pretty punk for a time in the Fuck sense yeah. that Sounds you know like- she's. She, it, it, see, punk rock wasn't about being politically correct. It never was. As a matter of fact, if we were living in, if this, if today's modern society was back in 1977, we never would have had the Ramones. We mm. never would have had the Pistols. We never would have had Motorhead or Metallica or mm. the Slayer or whatever. Somebody, you know, it's like every people just need to grow a fucking set, honestly, these days. But like, um, you know, if you think about like at the time when punk rock was going off and like, and I think about what it was trying to get across about being this individual, it's like you, you wanted your individuality and to kind of do your life on your terms. Mm-hmm. You didn't want to be, you didn't want to cat. You didn't want to like, I, I didn't want to be categorized as this. I just wanted to do what the fuck I wanted to do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Of like, course want a fucking you to recognize me or to uh to um even though i look like a fucking rodeo clown my point is it's like 
even though I looked like that, I did not want to be categorized. I didn't want to be, uh, you know, how do I even say it? I didn't, I just wanted to be me. You know, yeah. I didn't care it's, if anybody. I mean, punk was the place for outcasts who didn't have right. a place to be then. Mm. Yeah. And it's really and not I, any crazier than that. And I think in today's world, it's, there's so many attention seekers, you know what I mean? It's like, I'd much rather be laying in the cut. I know I look like a fucking rodeo clown. I get that part. Right. So there is some sort of like, you know, dilemma there, but my, I think at the end of the day, I just kind of wanted to live my life on my own terms yeah. and create a life. And I didn't want to like go get a job in an office or have to go to college or in my case, it would have been join the military, you know, because sure. mm. there wasn't, you know, I was never going to go to college, you know, mm. but, but he, I mean, you are a first generation American technically. Yes. Living yeah. the American, not technically, literally living the American dream, having used what you know your mom did to get you guys here yeah. to uh pioneer a genre of music and, and inspire millions well it's very <laughs> nice you know it, it's weird you know yeah. to think yeah. of it in that context because like and i think that bo i know you don't know me so well but colin i think you got a better sense of who i am you know i mean i enjoy your bands you know what i mean and i enjoy your music and your music has inspired me, you know? So it's like, it's, 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 that's the give and take of punk rock, hardcore, yeah. whatever it is, is that we're in this together. You know, it's not, it was never like, you know, the eighties kind of metal, uh, I won't even call it metal. It was just rock and roll, uh, excessive, you know, like, yeah, yeah cocaine strippers and corvettes nothing Sex, wrong drugs, with that rock and roll <laughs> nothing yeah. wrong with that but you know what i'm saying it's like um that wasn't where i was coming from i i i feel like i i was a little bit more uh, that wasn't really my deal now did right. that happen in my life absolutely thank <laughs> the lord but you know what i'm saying like we'll get there <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll get there yeah. but i mean uh but you know what i'm saying it's like that that wasn't where i set out yeah well i mean that's that's this is something that we talk about quite frequently is like, that is the beauty of punk and hardcore that you get, you get to where you are by being who you were and following this like unwritten kind of code of ethics. And that's how we can just kind of talk to you on a show like this, because over time you're going to, the, the guy in the band uh, and the mosher in the crowd are the same person. Same. Yeah. Right. right that's right. why we're here. Cause like, that's Amen. what in our minds, that's what we're doing on stage is like, we're just moshing, but playing while with riffs with a guitar, and, yeah. and words. Wow. What, uh, what were bands that you were involved in prior to Rancid and how did that kind of develop? Um, I started kind of like picking up guitar and just kind of playing to anything I could get my hands on, you know, and just like whatever, all I had, you know, I had my record collection, of course, but it was a lot easier to play the cassettes, right? So, okay. You know, because you could fast forward, rewind, yeah. and and I would just try to like make sounds, and I would just try to find like-minded in, in individuals, and I would I started playing with a few dudes here and there, and I remember this one guy, he was getting guitar lessons, so he taught me a lot, oh. you know. And then uh, he just sh showed me how to do like, I still don't know the names of chords. I really honestly don't, Same. but um, I just kind of know what sounds right. But like Gordy, the unknown bastard, who was also the forgotten, my first real band was kind of with him. Mm -hmm. So that would have been the 80, shit, 88, 89, somewhere around that, maybe even 87. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I can't remember when we met, but it was around in the, in the mid to late eighties. But, uh, he was a little younger than me and, uh, we, I just, I, he was a punk as fuck. He, he just had a huge Mohawk. Um, we almost, you know, we almost beat the shit out of each other. There's a funny story about that. Um, cause we almost, and he came to my block when we were kids and him and his buddy, and they were going to go drink at the, at the school. And I, and I saw these two dudes rolling on my neighborhood and I was with my friend, Eric and eric actually knew these guys and i was like yo what the fuck are you doing on my street <laughs> and um so you see so punks I, that you don't know and you're like what's up How, yeah. who fucking told you wow 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, I Territorial was very ter- punk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, because that, you know, I don't know why. But anyways, long story <laughs> short, we almost duped it out. Yeah. Right. Sure. It got it got heavy. Like it got heavy. And then we were at a um, a frontline show. Joe Sibiano, who's now a stand up comedian, his punk band was playing at One Step Beyond where I saw, you know, I, I but that was, you know, funny. First time I ever went to One Step Beyond, I was there for a rap show. Um, Ice T, Egyptian Lover, Houdini, and uh, one other. Oh, African Bombada and the Soul Sonic Force. Yeah. And I went with my friend Wade, Wade Mendoza. And I was the only, obviously, the only little punker there. But yeah. we go to this show, and I see this punker in the pit. And his mohawk's hanging down. I can't really recognize him because it's kind of dark. And there's these fucking, like, surfer douches that used to roll out to these shows mm-hmm. from Santa Cruz or wherever the fuck. And this is kind of more my neighborhood, more, more my manner. So, and I see them kind of fucking with this guy, right? And I know a few of the heads there, and they know me, and they obviously know my brother. So I was like, all right, you know, this kid's going to come around and they're going to push him and push him because he was the only one dancing, right? Mm-hmm. They're all just being too cool for school. So I go in there and I fucking put my arm around him, right? And my shirt sleeve gets caught on the studs on the top of his jacket, so I can't really let go, you know? So I'm kind of with him. And I remember this kid, he had an exploited like patch on his, on the, uh, Gordy did on the back of his jacket and some dude went to go rip it off. That's what made me grab it, grab Gordy. And then I didn't know it was this guy that I had just, you know, so we kind of were <laughs> dancing in the pit together. Cause I was like, kind of like leave this fucker alone. Yeah. Otherwise we're going to get, we're, we're going to go down. And, um, I kind of looked up at him cause Gordy's, uh, you know, like six, two. And I looked up at him and he looked down at me and we kind of like looked down and then we did a double take and realized that we had just been beefing like fucking four <laughs> weeks ago. And I was, and he just kind of looked at me and I kind of looked and I kind of went like that and he went like that. And then we were best friends. Wow. And it was like, that's how we kind of came together. In that's the pit, fucking, dude. In, in the pit, bro. The pit heals dreams. all. Forged in fire. God. Yeah. I mean, if everybody could just go to the pit, man. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then we started that band. It was called the Nowhere Men, and right. we named it after the anti Nowhere League song, yeah. um, Nowhere Man. But he misspelt it, so that's why it became the Nowhere Men. And then, <laughs> what are you gonna do? That's pretty, I mean, we, but it may, it's like a that's a that's cosmic, you know. That's yeah, a beautiful mistake. But what's even more cosmic is that you know we played a show with the, it was Melvin's, Capital Punishment, GFA, and Blast. Whoa. And I love oh, Blast, God. right? Yeah. And it was an all dayer It's called the Omni in Oakland. And the UK subs were pl- supposed to be playing at the Gilman Street. Their show got canceled, so they ended up coming to our show, where the Nowhere Men did a cover of Organized Crime by the UK subs, and that's pretty much the reason why I got the gig in the subs. Whoa. Wow. What were you doing in Nowhere Men? I was playing guitar. Were you singing, too? No, it's just background. Gordy was the lead singer. Pasta was based. We call him Pasta because he's Italian, of course. Of course. Um, um, I know about had... thirty-five pastas. Really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got angel hair. Yeah, we got Fusili. Uh, you got... don't fuck with Fusili. He's hard. No, not yeah, Fusili and fucking gluten free. He's no. a little grumpy. Yeah, no. But uh, um, but yeah, there was uh, Ken Head, who was from Texas. And he, he was kind of like a skinhead punk kind of guy, so we just called him Ken Head. And Sick. then there was Br- Brandon was on the other guitar, and he was just this long-haired just dude. Just Brandon, he, he huh? like, <laughs> But Brendan, 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 Brendan. Brendan. Yeah, and Brendan. His name and, was uh, called him. His name was Brandon, but you nicknamed him Brendan, Brendan. as like a rib? No, no I, think his, I think his legit name was Brendan. Okay. But he was like this long-haired thrasher dude. Like, he mm. loved, like, Exodus and Slayer. Like, Fuck he yeah. was not into punk at all. But he just liked our fast shit. Yeah. And he even had like a Charvel Jackson. But we just wanted guys that fucking played, you know? Mm-hmm. And that, you were crossing that was, over, dude. You were yeah. you were doing it right. Well, I mean, but that was the thing. It's like in around the eighties when DRI and and you know put out the crossover record. I mean, you would see bands like Death Angel or Exodus playing with Broken Bones or English Dogs or or whatever the fuck. And I think the thrash thing and the punk thing were so close. Yeah. That's when the kind of the beef between metalheads and punks started to kind of go away. You know what I mean? Cause I saw Exodus. It was so funny because 
I did Zetro, who is the singer for Exodus, his um, his podcast a few years ago. And when I was um, um, I was had done it, I was talking to my buddy Derek on the phone, and he's like, "What are you up to?" And I said, "Yeah, I just did Exodus as uh, the singer." And he goes, "Dude, do you remember when we saw Exodus in '86 at the fucking at the um, Palo Alto bubble?" And I was like, "Oh my god!" I totally <laughs> faced it, right? And I go, "Hey, bro!" I go, I, and I hit up the Zetra. I'm like, "Dude." I was just reminded I saw you guys in 86 in Palo Alto. And he goes, bro, that was my first show with the band. Wow. Whoa. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just, it's just like, you don't really realize that you were there at these places. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'd forgotten about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, but then I was witnessing, you know, this dude's first band with X. Wow. Wow. You know, so shit like that happens all the time. Just historical moments you happen to be in the room for, you know? I'm sure I know you've seen a lot of them did um, like watching hardcore and punk evolve from Mm -hmm. when you first found it. How, what, what do you, what are your thoughts on kind of where it is now as it's experiencing like a third period of commercial boom? I think it's fucking great, man, because for me, this is the stuff that I grew up listening to. Yes. It might be way different than maybe the, you know, like an agnostic front, like Agnostic Front was the first American skinhead band, and hardcore music is the first American skinhead music. It's not Oi. Mm-hmm. Oi was an English thing. OG American skinhead music is 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 hardcore, straight up. Um, when I see bands like Turnstile and these types of bands getting bigger, I'm like, fuck yes, because they're fucking badass. First of all. Um, and uh, I want to see this music become the most popular music in the world because that's how much I love it. Wow. Um, Everybody it, steals from it every day. So it's like yeah, we right. all might as well get a little <laughs> piece of the pie. You know? Listen, all, all ships rise with the tide. That's, yeah. that's, that's historically what happens with our music. And, when I, so, and I know that there's others out there other than Turnstile. I say them because I, I feel like they are kind of the king dog shit the right one. now yeah, in, yeah, in the world. Sure. And um, I love them. We've had a chance to, we took them out with us not too long ago for a few shows, fucking incredible dudes and they deserve it. And mm-hmm. it's like, you know, you, as a musician, the last thing that you're going to do is apologize for writing a good song. Amen. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, I personally, what I've experienced, like, I could only imagine if there was a Facebook or an Instagram back in 1995, like, fuck, (laughs) you know, like, I mean, just the amount of shit that we got just for doing what we were doing. Yeah. um, It's, it's, it's so much more magnified and, and uh, now to the, to this day, but I think that this genre of music in order for it to, to, to live, it has to evolve. It has to change and it has to get bigger. And however it's presented, I'm, those dudes, and I'm sure maybe you, you, I'm sure you guys know them, are solid dudes. Mm-hmm. The best. And and they deserve fucking. I hope they get. I hope they sell more records than Metallica. <laughs> like I really they do. Will. Yeah, they, it's an. I, 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 I hope one. that they do. I want them to because honestly, it almost it getting my ass kicked so fucking much when I was a kid by fucking jocks cops whatever it was when i see that and i've never really said this before because i feel like it's not a very humble thing to say but at the risk of sounding not humble i'm gonna say it but i feel like my blood and sweat and tears my ass kickings you guys now get to do that that was worth it absolutely man. you know and it's not even me and but and but i and if that sounds arrogant no you could sound double bitter. kick stance, but yeah, right. Like you could sound bitter. You could take the other path. Yeah, no. But like, you like fucking, the you the know. Larses of the world. You and the you the royal Larses. You know, <laughs> the guys that 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 pave the way uh, are the reason that bands like Turnstile can like fucking time bomb, dude. Yeah, well, come thank on. You. So but I you will, know what yeah, Turnstile we'll turn, But I will say Turnstile owes me nothing. You no, know, right. they, they're. They're getting there on their own merit, and because they're fucking badass, super rad, live, great fucking songs. So I'm not looking for like 
that. What I'm all I'm saying is like guys who are making fucking rad music. What you know, I'm gonna be a fan of because I, I like street down and dirty music. I like right. I want to I want to when I'm listening to your record, I want to feel like I want to punch a wall or 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 whatever. That's mm -hmm. what the the feeling I'm looking for. I can get that from Skinhead Reggae. I can get that from Aretha Franklin. I can get that <laughs> from fucking Motorhead and ACDC, and I can get it from Turnstile or Twitching Tongues, or I can get it from fucking um, watching um, Brody King fucking in, in a wrestling match. Damn, so I almost wore a okay. shirt today. That's what I was going to say is <laughs> how you're describing it is very similar to wrestling mentality of mm. just wanting to like, yeah, we did this during a scary time and wanting to like put newer, younger talents over, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's often what how i explain like when i meet someone who doesn't know anything about wrestling they don't they might know stone cold and hulk hogan and shit and like know the pageantry and like kind of the stigma but they don't have any idea what goes on behind the scenes obviously which to me is the most appealing part about wrestling and it's very similar to music where it's like yeah we want to take this band out to show them to the world kind of a thing you know it's really really similar and i think and then a month later they're the biggest fan in the world yeah and you're just excited for them yeah yeah it's awesome yeah you know i i feel like with the pro wrestling connection with my life i mean i got exposed to that right around the same time i got exposed to punk and like you said the pageantry because i loved kiss like kiss was my first band and when we were when my mom and dad got divorced me my mom took me and my brother to denmark and uh, my cousin um, w was 16 or so at the time. And I was like, I had my third birthday over there. But we used to go into a room and she would play records. And it was like T-Rex and oh. um, Sweet and Mabel and Chicory Tip and uh, Slade and all this stuff. And so it's like, it's no wonder. You know, I didn't really, you know, put that together at the time when I was three. But like, as we've grown and had conversations and I remember sitting on her lap and she's playing records, but no wonder I love Kiss because Kiss wanted to be those bands, right? Yeah. Everybody's and doing somebody. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I think that with the wrestling thing, reason probably why I caught onto it was the Kiss, you know, because uh, I love the pageantry and the, the kiss of it the, all. The, yeah, the <laughs> kiss of it all, bro. Yeah. So, and I remember like, connecting and when in the early 80s when a lot of my friends you know a lot of the punks obviously went on to you know get jobs or join the army or they died or they went to jail or whatever and for me my scene started getting smaller and, and it wasn't mm -hmm. up until i really met gordy that i actually found some people to hang out with that were still kind of on my same page because everybody kind of grew up because all the guys that i were friends with were you know five, six, seven years older than me, you know? Right. So right. they would all have to get, you know, be adults or they would move up to the city or Berkeley or whatever the fuck. So there was a period of time where it was me being punk at my house watching wrestling. You know, that was like the only connection I it. had, you know, because I had no friends because <laughs> in a lot of ways because, you know, the, my friends whose parents... You know, I, I had been to Juvenile Hall at, uh, now twice at that time. And so a lot of the, my people, friends that I had that didn't care that I was punk, their parents still wouldn't let me hang out with them mm. because I was a bad kid, oh, right? Yeah, because I went to juvie or whatever, yeah. you know, and rightfully so. Like, How many, um, how many um, gold records do, the, do those kids have? <laughs> <laughs> Not many. Fuck but um, you. unless I sent them one, which I doubt I did. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I mean, for me, like the wrestling gave me an escape, you know. And I think a lot of the times I look at a set list like a wrestling match, right? So you got to come out, you got to get some, you got to tie up, you got, you, you know, you got to fucking, you know, you got to come out with a little bit of a bang to get people the entrance. Engaged. The entrance is yeah, important. The entrance is huge. Fuck yeah. yeah. The open. So. <laughs> You know it's going to be radio roots. You know those are you know, and then you know you know the finish. The finish is time bomb Ruby Soho, right? So you know right. you know the finish. So you're working your way backwards, and so the middle of the set is always like you got to have a few, you know, you know where the baby face. You got some shine, you know, whatever. Like yeah. you got to work it, you know. But you got to you got to maybe do like a Hoover Street. You got to bring it down to yeah, the back. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You know, Cold for a minute, and then, catch your breath. 
<laughs> yeah, and then you then you, then you come up, you start bringing up, you bring it up with the ska, which is a little more like you're know, reversing the yeah, figure yeah. four. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I always kind of look at like that. I think. Oh, wow, dude, that. that was incredible. I love that. <laughs> People don't get it. People don't understand no, no. the the wrestling thing. We're slowly getting the listeners. <laughs> We're chipping it, away at the wrestling thing. So you talked about how nowhere men play with UK subs. Yeah. No, we played a show with the Melvins, but the UK subs were in the audience oh, because their okay. show at Gilman Street got canceled. Yep. Right. So they're just there. They watch you cover them and they go, yo, that bloke just <laughs> fucking ripped that shit. We got to get well, him. Well, this is what happened. So like after our set, I went over to the bar. I recognized Charlie Harper and he said, hey, really great set tonight. And I said, thanks. And he said, can I buy you a drink? And I said, sure. And so he bought me a beer and we just sat talking and whatever. And as the conversation grew, he said, Hey, we're actually losing our guitar player after this tour, which I don't think the guitar player, no. And it was Carl Morris who was obviously in broken bones and the exploited. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did horror epics. And I think let's start a war with the explorer exploited. And I think he might have did, done FOAD with Broken Bones. I, I don't quote me, but Carl was like, you know, a, he's he's still a great, he's a good friend to this day. But uh, he, he's a, an amazing guitar player. And basically, Charlie, at the end of the day, we exchanged phone numbers, and he said that he would, would like me to join the band. But I thought honestly that he was just being very nice to me. Yeah. Um, because you know, I, we had done a cover of one of their songs. So I was the, the, this was on a, uh, a, a Saturday mm -hmm. or yeah, it was a Saturday. So, um, on the Monday I was supposed to, he, the plan was me to call him on Sunday and I didn't do it because I thought he was like, just kind of, you know, being nice to me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Monday. 9 a.m. in the morning, the phone rings at my mom's house, and I'm sleeping on the living room floor because I was sort of in between places because I was kind of living in Hayward, but not really living. It's, it was, it's very You're convoluted. living the lifestyle, brother. I yes. get it. <laughs> I, was going from, from, I was going from house to house. Yeah. So my mom goes, uh, for whatever reason, she was off of work that day, and she goes, Lars, there's some guy with an English accent on the phone for you. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So I get up and I'm, I pick up the phone and he goes, and he goes, Lars, it's Charlie. And I'm like, oh, hey, Charlie, what's going on? He goes, yeah, you were supposed to call me yesterday. I wanted to get together with you. And I was like, oh, well, Charlie, I, I didn't know, like, you know, that, you know, that you were that serious. And so we started talking some more and he goes, well, where do you live? Cause we're in Oakland right now. I said, I live in Campbell and he goes, Oh, I know Campbell. I'm like, you know, Campbell. He goes, is that bar the apple still there? And I'm like, how the fuck <laughs> does Charlie Harper know about a shitty bar in Campbell? And he goes, yeah, I did some time there in 1975 or whatever. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> so me and Charlie were living in the same fucking town in 1975. Wow. Oh, like wow. what are the odds? Right. Wow. So basically he said, can you get up to Oakland today? So we can talk. I said, sure. I said, but I have to do a few things and then, um, you know, I'll get up there. So I basically uh, took the the bus to the BART up there at the time. It was like three or four buses to the BART station in, in Fremont. And then I would have to, to train from there. So it, it would take like three to four hours. Right. So uh, I kind of got up, got ready, got up to this address, which was in like the deep. Oh, it was the heart of fucking Oakland. And they had a Winnebago that they were all staying in. And so we, we you know, I got up there. We started, you know, he goes, hey, bear, bear naked in the buck bottom or buck naked and the bare bottom boys are playing at the old I-beam on Haight Street. Do you want to go? I said, yeah, let's go. So we hopped on the train, the BART train to go after we had, you know, had a few drinks or whatever. And we ended up getting lost because we were talking so much. And so. Um, I didn't have, I remember cause he asked me to bring a demo tape and I couldn't find, I didn't have a dual cassette player, but I had the demo tape, but I only had one. And this is the demo tape of the nowhere man. Right. So, um, I remember I called, that's what took me so long to get up there. Those and were the few things you had to do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So wow. anyway, um, 
So, story short, I ended up spending the night on the Winnebago with them in Oakland. I got home the next day. They were going. He was married to a woman from Kenosha, Wisconsin at the time. So mm. after the American tours, Charlie would go and he would stay in Kenosha mm. uh, for like a month or two, the summers. And uh, what was her fucking name? Anyway, it doesn't matter. So <laughs> this was in July, early July, around July 4th. So, or maybe middle. So what I did is I finally found a dual tech, tape deck and he said, do me a favor, send me the cassette to this address in Kenosha. So here's, here's the best part about the story. So fast forward to August, I had sent him out the demo tape, whatever. I'm out on the, uh, the 29th of August. My birthday is the 30th. I'm with, with a bunch of friends. We're all having a birthday party. That's how we used to do our birthday parties. We'd start them at midnight. And so I, I'd been up all night, like on speed, and I'd been drinking, and I'd been doing all this stuff. The good and stuff. then when I, yes, and when I got home the next day, there was a package on, so this is my legit birthday, August 30th, and there's a package from Charlie Harper, and inside there's a letter that says, you're in the band, I can't believe you want to leave the band that you're in, you know, please get a plane ticket as soon as you can, here's my English number, my English address, get to England, we have a show, October, blah, 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 with x-ray specs, can you make it? Whoa, holy shit. So I went and got a job at Togo's, because now I had some months to work I, togos I, I got, was a thing then oh yeah bro we, the <sighs> first togos was in campbell california What's there it is. Mind, there you mind you uh or san jose excuse me but anyways doesn't matter close enough <laughs> i went i got this job for a couple weeks right got yeah. enough money i saved up enough to buy the plane ticket which was i think 500 dollars. which and then holy shit then yeah. i quit then i quit the job and because I didn't think I didn't need, didn't need any more money, boy. Yeah. You know, I was 19, 18, yeah. 19 years old. You know, <clears throat> my mom helped me go get a passport, which was also money I also made because I had to pay for the passport. Yeah. They weren't free at the time or ever. And um, I think I, when I left to England, I had two bags, uh, a $40 check that my aunt gave me for my birthday. It was $20. And like maybe a hundred bucks in my pocket in a wow. carton of cigarettes. And that's kind of what I went over to England with. And that's how pretty much I, I ended up in that band. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. So where in that does, does Tim Armstrong try to poach you for rancid? So I come back from that because it wasn't a good uh, ending to that story. Uh -huh. um, because I, you know, for me, like, drinking using and all the things like i brought the neighborhood with me to england which it wasn't really the best idea you know so i was in a lot of trouble over there too like i got us banned from a town um old i actually town? got a yeah old town <laughs> i actually got i got a picture of us from that town that's like the one picture i have from the subs with me in the band uh that actually charlie gave to me about 15 years ago and he's like, do you remember this photo as he's handing it to me? And I said, I said, fuck, wh where was that? And he goes, that's the town that you got us banned from. We still haven't been able to go back there. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit. So we have a laugh about it. But um, yeah, because I end up like there was a it was bad. I don't want to get too lost in it. But sure. um, I came I came home. I started a band with the guy, Sean Gregonis, who originally um, introduced us to punk because he was around again. And we did this little band where I was now lead singing, playing guitar. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up playing with Rancid at Gilman Street when Rancid was still a three-piece. So this is what happened. About two weeks later, I go to a UK sub show that the UK subs uh, don't show up to because it gets canceled. Oh. But who's there? Is Brett? See, the UK subs are, are playing a, 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 a role in my life. Yeah. Brett Reed is there. Brett Reed is there. We start talking, and Brett says to me off the cuff, "Yeah, we're looking for another guitar player." And I said, "Well, I'll do it." And he said, "Okay, well, I'm going to give Tim your number." So the next day, Tim calls me up because he remembers me when we met in when with my band playing with him, and he says, "Hey, right. are you serious?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said, "Well, we're going down." to make a record for Epitaph. Do you have any problems with Epitaph? I'm like, I don't even know fucking Epitaph. Bad religion. Like, <laughs> fuck yeah, bro. 
go for it, rad, you know, Bad Religion, right? They're the biggest punk band in the world at that time. Yeah. And uh, he says, well, I'm going to send you the demo tape, and I'm going to send you the first 7-inch, which is on Lookout. So he sends it to me, and so I sit there, and I learn it. And um, my band at the time was supposed to go down and play this place called the Doll Hut in Anaheim. Mm. And the bass player had girl problems. So a day before we were supposed to go down there, he calls and quits, right? Because his girlfriend gave him an ultimatum, the band or her, he chose her. Um, Anyways, he's, anyway, doesn't matter. No (laughs) resentment. But then literally after I hung up the phone with that, Tim calls me and he's like, hey, do you want to join the band or what? And I was like, yeah, my band just broke up. And he said, okay, well, let's get you going. Can you come down to LA? And it was now, now it was like a thing. Do you want, are we going to take this new guy and put him on the first record? And I said, mm. hey, Tim, like, I really want to earn this. Mm. Like, let me earn it. And thank God that they didn't, you know, go with me sight unseen because, you know, the, my first, after my first band practice with them, that's when, you know, my life sort of changed. Because uh, and what I was doing, sort of, uh, you know, drinking and using and all the other things sort of had to kind of go by the wayside because I don't think it was kind of hit you like, oh, this is real. This is a real chance at a a bigger life. Well, two things that really that I remember about learning that tape is I remember because I wasn't living at home at the time and my brother was still living there. Mm-hmm. Cause he was between places and uh, I was listening to the cassette in there and I was practicing to it. And my brother goes, and it was Matt Freeman was singing and he goes, Hey, pause that for a second. So I pause and he goes, dude, is, is that dude, is that dude like a big black skinhead or something like that singing? I'm like, what do you mean? And he goes, he sounds like a fucking gnarly Skinhead. And I go, no, it's Matt Freeman or whatever. And he goes, well, listen, I'll tell you what right now. If you don't join this band, I'm going to kick your ass. Wow. An older and, brother's uh, word is law, as I, <laughs> I, I can tell you firsthand. <laughs> bro, it's like there's a story about my brother was a tough motherfucker, right? And like there's a, when I got stabbed that one time, like, you know, I, I, if you, I can tell that story all the time, but, um, Anyways, that's what really, that's the moment that I, that I take, you know I mean? It's like my brother saying that, uh, thinking that Freeman was a big black skinhead, which is, you know, it, like those are the things that I, I take from that, that, that place. Like, well, cause I that, that statement was said with like, Hey, this is, that's the coolest thing in the world. Yeah, exactly. Right, right, you have exactly. to join this. This is the coolest thing in the world. Right. Because, I mean, that that was the thing I feel like that really propelled me into going that route. And then when we had our first band practice and I got shit hammered and embarrassed everybody um, and was pulling out my dick in front of the Berkeley Square and telling Joe Sib I was going to fucking beat the shit out of him. <laughs> he didn't buy me a, a shot of Jack Daniels. A lot of this stuff I remember. A lot of this stuff I don't. Sure. Um but Tim pulled me aside and said, hey, listen, dude, it's either drinking or the band. And I was like, it's the band. Because I knew yeah. that if I came home with my tail between my legs and I had fucked this up, my brother was a man of his word, you know, <laughs> and he probably would have kicked the shit out of me. I mean, right. I'm surprised I survived with him. I mean, he stabbed me twice, you know what I mean? So it's like, I he was serious. He was Minor serious. arteries or... <laughs> Well, he stabbed me in the back with a pencil one time and broke off the tip in my back, which they still never got out. He didn't know that that would go in, though. That was that was. Oh, he knew. He he fucking knew. He (laughs) fucking knew. He fuck. He was one of the most gnarly, violent dudes. He was trying to sharpen it. He figured your back was fair game. That was a mistake. The other one, I can't. Well, I was in the shower. I was in the shower, and I was naked as a jaybird, obviously, as you do in the shower. Mm -hmm. And I must have been about 15 or 16, and he had a knife, and he started making the fucking uh, psycho. psycho. Trying to to recreate this psycho scene with me in the shower. And I'm literally like, go like this, you know. (laughs) And he got me on the arm, you know what I mean? And he started laughing, this maniacal laugh that he always used to have. 
I don't think he was high either. That was the thing. That was the scary part. You know, he was just vibing. He was just like, "This is funny. This is good." He was stuff. Violent, v, yeah. violent, not vibing. <laughs> Fuck that. Yeah, but well. you know, he, he he's dead now, so it's like he, he he's probably laughing about it up there, but or wherever he, he did is, all but, that so that you'd have shit to talk about. You know, bro, he toughened me up. Mm. Right. He toughened me up. I mean, we didn't have a dad around, and mm. I remember. One time I was shaving. I was about, this was after the stabbing, after the, you know, or before the stabbing incident when I got stabbed by these fucking goofballs at a party. But like I was shaving and I had my shirt off and he came behind me and he grabbed me like as hard as he could on, by my tits and lifted me up. And I just reacted and just punched him like that. And I caught him right in the chin and he dropped against the wall. And as I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to get fucking killed. Yeah. And he stands up and he turns me around and goes, I've been waiting for you to do that for 16 years. Wow. And turned around and walked away. And I was like, okay. Like, that was a moment. You slayed the thought, fucking dragon. I, I slayed the dragon, bro. Wow. But yeah, I know we got lost off the subject, but no, that's no, how no. I got into the subject. No, that's, that's how I got into the subject. That's real, man. Pardon this interruption. This episode is brought to you by Athletic Greens, and we're here to talk to you about. AG1. AG1. Bo, tell me about your journey with AG1 so far. I'm running low, so I'm sweating it. This is gold for me right now. Oh, you man. Know? Uh, we got to get a re-up. We I... do have to get a re-up, and you know they're going to give it to us because they we they knew that we yeah, need knew. this, this <laughs> dietary know. daily supplement. Um, I start off every day on an empty stomach with AG1, and I take my little vitamin D drops in there, and I never get... I'm very sensitive. I never get a tummy ache. I'm not saying this will happen for everyone. I'm just saying mm -hmm. for me, no tummy ache, no nausea, no nothing. It's a good way to start my day. I like to fast as it is. And it wow. makes me feel like, okay, I'm getting this in. I'm getting my vitamins in. See, I forget I'm no good with vitamins. So I'll be, it'll be 5, 6 p.m. Yeah. And I'll find myself thinking like, why do I feel so, so poopy all of a sudden? Mm. And then I'll see my gorgeous green canister sitting on the counter and i'll go oh my god my ag1 i haven't done it yeah this is not people think i'm we're like shilling out or whatever like wayne's world style or something but like we do not accept ads that we don't agree with or use that's just really sad they had to convince us yeah to to like they it was a it was a mutual thing where they fought for us and then we were like okay we accept because we have found it so physically beneficial to us and our terrible bodies with our terrible diets. You you truly have the best sum up, which I'll do while you're gulping, is you don't necessarily notice when you take it, feeling any one which way. However, when you don't take it... When you oh, forget? Oh, it's like, oh, wow, this is how I felt before this, huh? Yeah. This is My body has just been begging me for this one thing <laughs> this whole time. AG1.com. Athleticgreens.com slash hardlore. Hardlore, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get five, five of these. free travel packs of AG1. That's you five You go days. anywhere, you got your daily supplement with you. And? It's just a little powder you pour it into this gorgeous bottle, mix it in any bottle of water, delicious. And you get a year's supply, which I believe is this whole tincture yeah. of the D3 plus K2 vitamin. 600 vitamin servings in this little bottle. That's like two years. <laughs> right basically <laughs> so that's a liberal year it is also what not time what not oh my god i'm a believer i'm obsessed yeah. yeah yeah i didn't get it <laughs> i didn't get it you know four months ago five months ago i didn't get it then we well, started the doing concept it. was a little lost on it right yes kind of that got it's it's twitch meets cameo meets ebay it really is it is the it is the best place to buy and sell any kind of memorabilia real realistically mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and our our guest on this episode Lars Fredrickson is on there you know who else is on there Brody King my favorite person <laughs> Dan Housen all ego Ethan Page wow uh tons of people you know the tons of different products toys cards games mm -hmm. shirt uh, uh now it's the best place to buy and sell hardcore vintage memorabilia uh, realistic yeah of course shirts vinyl so be sure to join us at the end of every month. I think our, our policy is pretty much the last Friday of every month. Yeah. Is Hardlore Whatnot Day. It's the, it's going to be the only place where you can buy certain Hardlore shirts. 
Uh, you're, we, we're going to always have old stuff from our vans and our friends' bands, records, rare stuff. You can come, you can bid, you can hang out, and you basically watch a two-hour-ish live hard lore episode that is never seen again. Mm-hmm. And we have we typically do around 10 items each, so that's a lot of stuff you can get. We do giveaways. We do all kinds exactly. of stuff. Love so d- uh, click the link in the description for 15 bucks off your first purchase. And it's also Manscaped time, baby. Pew. We've we been scaping Mans- men for oh. months now. <laughs> we, and we got our packages coming. I can't wait. Oh, that body we got wash. Body wash coming. I'm staying thick as thieves with the crop yeah. preserver. And yeah, the you're reviver. preserved and I'm revived. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm living deliciously since, <laughs> since Manscaped came you into are. my life you know black philip living life that's me man Enjoying i smell the great taste of i smell yeah. good I'm like balls are barely balls you know might as well be my elbow at this point <laughs> it's all one thing and that's thanks to manscaped so I, use code hard for 20 percent off plus free shipping yes i was just gonna say i we you know we kind of have a golden ticket i've tried a myriad of products i've yet to f- even find a thing where i'm like yeah like everything, I'm like, oh, this smells great. Like every every single Manscaped product that we get sent is like, yeah, I could use this forever. <laughs> you yeah, know? exactly. Yeah, I so. could keep this in stock for the rest of my days on mm-hmm. Earth. Mm-hmm. So we hope that you feel the same. And, you know, we're, we, our goal is to get you 20% off those things and free shipping. <laughs> free shipping. So you use code HARDLORE, you scape your man. If you, you know, you buy it for your partner. Your ex, mm, mm. if you want to fuck with him, you dad, know? your dad. I sent my dad an extra lawnmower that I that I had gotten from Manscaped. Lord knows, dad's balls be stanking, and this okay. is the only <laughs> remedy. Okay, ball dad bows, dad's <laughs> balls needed this, <laughs> and thank God his son has a podcast where he could make that a reality. I love you, dad. <laughs> Back to the episode. So, so the gravity of what rancid would eventually be mm. was something that you were feeling like off the rip. Practice number one. You know, I just wanted to be part of a really fucking good band, and I loved everything about that band. I loved their hooks. I loved their chord progressions. I loved everything about it. And I remember when I sat down for that first practice and Tim said, can you play me Animosity? Can you play me this? Can you play me that? And I just effortlessly just did it. And he said, okay, you've got this. Because, you know, I just wanted, I sat and, and and immersed myself into that for days, you know, and really learned it and wanted to be, I learned both parts. Like yeah. whatever I could hear, I just thought I'd learn it just, mm-hmm. you know, and if I got it close or whatever, I didn't necessarily know that it would become what it become became. But I did start to see that, like, every time that we played a show, there would be 50 more people, Mm. 100 more people, Mm. you know. And then now we're selling out Gilman Street. Now we're selling out this place. Then we're on the road in 1993. And then our video in December of 1993 is being played on MTV Hyena. This is predates Green Day, Offspring, all those bands. You know what I mean? And we learned about it. We were in Europe at the time on tour with uh, with rancid and it was like December. It went from the end of November to January, 1994. That's was the first European tour, but we were out on the road with rancid in sep- August, September, a little bit to October. And I, I tribute to the hardcore thing. Cause see, I remember you were saying that stormy shepherd was booking us mm. and stormy shepherd obviously was booked a, all hardcore bands. We were the mm-hmm. first punk band that she booked. And I think the offspring came later or the offspring came first. And that's how we found out. I don't remember totally, but when we would play shows on that first U S run, we were playing with all hardcore bands, right? which was, was very unheard of at the time because hardcore played hardcore shows. Punk rockers played punk rock shows. Yeah. They, the streams did not cross Egon, but then you, you know, have they, AF shouting out punks and skins. In, in, the, it, in the tracks and it's like they're begging for it <laughs> but the first time that it really kind of came together in a long time is when we played with sick of it all at uh, city gardens in new jersey mm. and that was the first time that like a punk band like us with mohawk studs leathers the whole thing 
played with the hardcore band. You know what I mean? And it was a fucking, that became a friendship and a bond because we ended up doing that out on the West coast too. And I think, and then we started playing because we play with bands um, like sheer terror Mm -hmm. and um, mad ball. And, you know, we, we started playing with a lot of the hardcore bands, which I think was more, for me personally, I will say more aligned with the kind of people that I grew up with. Sure. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. The attitude, the, the, and I, the music in that scene. I remember in like 95, 96, when we were, you know, all come the wolves was, was doing its thing. It's like, I, I would go to mostly hardcore shows mm-hmm. because nobody treated me weird. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, like wow. it was, you know, like I would go see powerhouse or um and they're just glad uh, that you're there they're just like oh yeah lars is lars of course he's here and those were my homies like me and chris Chris is powerhouse the singer is the godfather to both of my kids right he's like my brother you know so we we had that bond and then eddie and ernie of course from the band but you know it was it was such a different vibe because i would you know I'm trying to remember of all the bands that were going off back then, but like all the hardcore shows I would be out of. I mean, that's where me and Davey, you know, Havoc, like we would see each other all the time. And it was like the hardcore thing, you know, when we would go to a show, it was a little bit more akin to um, what I remembered shows being when I was a young kid, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, because now that we were sort of out in the public, we were kind of more of a public band you know, there were, there were, there were people who didn't like that, yeah, you know? And, uh, I just, I wanted to, I wanted to go and, in, and in, into a place and just enjoy music and dance and, and do those things. And, and, and that that's all we community. got brother. <laughs> well, but that's we the got. thing. It's like the hardcore community really accepted, you know, rancid just because I think we played with a lot of those bands to begin with. And those became all of our friends, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. it wasn't, you know, we weren't, you know, we knew green day, but we weren't super tight with them. We knew sure. the offspring, but we weren't super tight with them. Yes. We you know, were on the same label. We knew no effects, but we weren't super tight with, you know, like we weren't palling with these guys every day. We knew them. We loved them. Sure. Hi. Love you. But like, I'd go to New York and I'd see Paul bear. I'd see fucking the Kohler, the Kohler, Pete Kohler. And I'd see Roger. I'd see Freddie. I'd see fucking, you know, whoever it was, mm-hmm. you know, Ezak or Toby Morris or, you know, me and Toby were fucking thick as thieves and be me, Toby and Ezak, you know what I mean? And it, it just, it was like, that's, you know, what it was, you know, uh, 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 25 to life would come into town Fuck and, <laughs> you know, like we would go see them. They 25 to life stayed here. That's how I met Warren. You know, it's like, it's like a, a lot of the, it was mostly the hardcore, like, you know, if, if bands needed a place to stay, they, cr- they crashed in my house. Nice. You know what I mean? Cause I had a, you know, a house and I was like, fuck it, take the couch, you yeah. know, or, you know, whatever, sleep here. You got sleeping bags. Let's go get you <laughs> something. You know, like that's the way, you know, my mom let social distortion sleep on our fucking floor when I was like 11, dude, so like you kept that going. Th- you, you know, you got it. That's, you have to pay it forward. Right. Wow. Mm-hmm. Is that true? That's so yeah. cool. She Boy, hated yes. the fact that we were punk, but she, come on in, guys. Let me make you some frozen hamburgers. <laughs> Hell Not yeah, even kidding. Not Let even me kidding. ask you something about that time, Lars. Sure. What was going through mohawk, leopard print hair, Lars's mind, the first time he sees a spin kick in the pit? <laughs> were you like, fuck yeah? Or were you? Fuck yeah. Okay, first like time scared, I ever bo- saw- scared boner moment again? straight up but it was like a good boner <laughs> yes you know what i mean because i wanted to be in it and i remember it was a, we me and tim went and saw madball at the limelight and this would have been 1994 and minus was in the pit and he's swinging a bicycle chain in this the is pit. already perfect <laughs> minus is like my brother from another mother like me wow. and him when we're together it's the best thing it's always you know there, there's a group of us right when we get together for the bowl or whatever Mm-hmm. and minus is the homie i i love him to death like he's just the best dude he's the funniest guy like i wish he i, I would i would literally le- legit let minus live in my house with me right now like that's one guy that minus if say, you're watching he <laughs> lives in florida me. he's got a great life but my point is is like he's the one he's like one there's many but that yeah. dude ever needs anything it's like 
that's my homie. But I remember seeing him swinging that bicycle chain and just doing the fucking picking up change. And I'm just like, this is fucking, ah, ah. Yeah. you know, like I wanted to get in there. Yeah. Now, I don't think 155 pound me at the time would have would have been able to handle myself in that environment. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's that was the limelight 1994 Madball. Wow. That was art. The, yeah, there that couldn't have been a better me. answer. You just painted a painting for me <laughs> and oh, gave right it to on. me for free. Thank you. Right uh, minus, minus doesn't remember that. <laughs> um, one thing that you touched on really briefly was mm-hmm. when you were talking about wanting to join like a, a serious band, as in like going like strong, foundationally sound. You mentioned like hooks. Mm-hmm. Rancid has some of the coolest melodies and hooks like like in in all of alternative like punk music stuff where i hear fucking ruby soho comes out and that song is in my goddamn head until the Ear, next time earworms you know I mean? ear yeah. straight up a hive of earworms where like right in the beginning of the conversation you mentioned like whether it's this that aretha franklin whatever like did you grow up listening to I guess like pop music because like a lot of the hooks and a lot of like the chord resolutions and where you guys end up when it's time. The the song structures are, are, are are classically pop structures. Exactly. There's gotta be a reason why they resonate so well. Well, you know, I think that, um, my exposure to music is not, I mean, maybe now it's cool, but like when I think back about what my mom used to listen to, it was a lot of like Kenny Rogers and, Engelbert Humperdinck and <laughs> um, Natalie Wood. Um, she liked her voice. But the thing that I remember Natalie the Wood most, had songs? I believe she did. I'm 99% sure wow. that I have some of her. What could I, I, this woman do before she was <laughs> murdered? I know. Trying and um, that's the reason why I know that story is because of my mom. But my um, so... Christmas time was always a special time because my mom never drank, but she would have like a w- one or two beers on Christmas, Christmas Eve, right? Mm. And I just remember her, she would break out the Christmas, uh, or excuse me, the Danish music. And this shit sounded like straight up oi. What? Because it's drinking songs. Oh. And it's like, they're like, you know, fucking big hooky choruses where it's like 50 dudes in a fucking bathroom, you know, with one headphone off. So everybody else can hear like doing the backgrounds. Like hooligan vibes. Dude. And it, but it's so, it's given me goosebumps just to talk about it because it's this powerful music. And she used to sing along and she'd drink like a Heineken or a Carlsberg or whatever the fuck she was drinking. And she'd get a little tipsy off half a beer and she'd start singing and doing this, this whole thing. And, you know, she would kind of get into her space. And me and my brother would just kind of like giggle and watch her. And um, then we would steal the rest of the six pack that she bought. But, um, <laughs> but that That's was like, so cool. Mom keep singing. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But, um, you know, that's the stuff that really made the impression. And thank the Lord that before she died, I had was able to have the conversation about who these artists were mm. that she was listening to. And I got all those records and all those CDs downstairs. I just haven't been able to bring them up just yet because it's like it's it's still, you know, it's only a few years ago that she's passed. And, you know, I still got my little thing around it. But sure, that's the stuff that I think really made the impression. But music wasn't like a thing that really was on all the time in the house. My dad, when he was around, you know, I remember... We would be in his GTO. He had this gold GTO with a rag top. And it was like two seats. And um, like me and my brother would sit both on on on, on one of the seats. And my dad would be blasting Boogie, Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy from Company B or whatever. Yeah, the Boogie that Boogie song. Boogie from Company B. Yeah. And I remember we were at a stoplight. And we were on... <laughs> Uh, Bud Avenue, Santa Moss, Aquino Road. We're waiting for the stoplight, and my dad's drinking Coors, and there's no seatbelts. And my dad turns to my brother and says, Hey, Robert, 
hand me that gun underneath the the uh, the seat. And my brother reaches out and he's got a, he's got a little twenty two, and my dad throws the fucking beer cans out as we're waiting the stoplight and starts shooting at it. And I was like, we thought it was the raddest, funnest, coolest thing. Yeah, of course. Ever. You know, he hit him. He hit the cans. How, how I don't name? remember that. I just, <laughs> just remember the the, the soundtrack. <laughs> the soundtrack being the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy from Company B or whatever that Pardon song. Me boy, is this the chat? <laughs> <laughs> so that's like, like the hardest song ever in the back of your mind <laughs> of that moment. Pardon me, but that, that, those are the <laughs> those are the first musical impressions I feel like that I remember. Those are like, huge but, impressions. Yeah, you know, wow. I mean, so, I love the idea that one of the most influential biggest punk bands had hooks inspired by this crazy niche subcultural thing <laughs> that ties into everything else you know it like that, that's amazing well tim loved it you know so many different things he had older brothers too me and tim are both younger brothers he's the youngest of three i'm the youngest of two right so and then freeman like he learned on french horn right so he was a horn player that, and he's like the musical genius that can pick up anything and figures it out. Right. Mm -hmm. And then Brett was, you know, obviously younger than me because Freeman and, and Tim are six years older than me. And then oh. uh, Brett Reed was a year younger than me, but now Brandon is now six younger years younger than I am. So there's like, I think we bring a, a wide scope of things to it. And I, and I think at the end of the day, like what Matt and Tim really like, you know, when I when when we have conversations about it, we all like that rock music. We all love the Ramones. We all love ACDC. But Matt loved X, and he also loves Dio and shit like that. And then mm -hmm. Tim loved like, you know, Tim like Kiss. You know, mm -hmm. Tim like fucking AC, loves ACDC. Yeah. You know what I mean? He, and so it's like we we had all that rock stuff, right? But then the, what was that punk shit too? You know, it's like mm -hmm. we loved the Circle Jerks. We loved Black Flag. I loved a lot of the oi stuff. Matt loved a lot of the, you know, Southern California stuff. Tim like loves hardcore. Like if there's the hardcore influence on Rancid, that I would say he would be the one that that, that brought that originally. Like, wow, cool. you know, I would, you know, we saw you today. We saw these bands fucking um, go and shit like that. You know, mm -hmm. like we saw a lot of these bands back in the day, you know, and I feel like we saw, we loved the Cadillac tramps. We loved, we loved, we loved everything that as long as it was like street music, I think we incorporated it somehow and made our own thing. And what we sure. thought a lot of people used to say we sounded like the clash. They still do. And that's a totally great comparison. Um, it's better than to be compared to, to Bon Jovi. But like, <laughs> if you listen to like sham or if you listen to the ruts mm. or if you listen to some other bands, I think you might for, find that. I, I think the clash was the obvious, right? Yeah. 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 But I, I think if you listen to Rancid, there's more than just a clash band. You know what I'm saying? One thousand percent. So yeah. you know, and I and I think that the, the English influence is just as strong as the American influence, but I also think there's these other things that come with it that maybe little dominoes that mm -hmm. that, that that paint the whole picture, you know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But I mean none of us would be here without Motorhead. Like, I mean, <sighs> you know, it's seriously like Amen. if you think about hard rock music that is today or just whether it's the turnstiles the rancids the twitching tongues the fucking whoever it is the fucking yeah. gods hates <laughs> all the bands yeah. it all starts with one band and it's motorhead and because it if there's no motorhead there's no there's no music that we know hard music today yeah if you, th if you think about judas priest and 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 all these other bands Think, listen to their '70s records, and then listen to what yeah. Motorhead was doing, right, yeah. and then see what then they did after that fucking Overkill came out. Like, Motorhead was doing this before <laughs> anybody. Motorhead They're invented "fuck you," which changed everybody's attitude. I mean, you think about all of that music, thrash, you know, it, whether it's Metallica, it's all this, yeah, you know, and I mean, that's Metallica, what makes it good. Metallica had to move to the Bay Area before they got good, so it's like. <laughs> Sorry, and, guys. But I mean, Metallica and other Lars are very vocal about Motorhead, Motorhead. being the <laughs> band, you know? Well, a lot of people shit on Lars, you know? And I don't understand that. And no. because. And, and justice for Lars, dude. Dude, straight yeah. up. Yeah. Listen, I asked him one time, I said, hey, listen, I have a feeling that 
you, uh, your style of drumming is just you trying or is heavily influenced to being filthy animal Taylor. Mm. And he's like, yeah, he goes, no one's really ever said that to me. And if you listen to filthy animal Taylor and you listen to Lars Ulrich, it's like they yeah. meet, mm. you yeah. get it now you get yeah. it. So, and Lars is a great fucking dude. I, I love that dude. So he's whatever. objectively one of the greatest musical minds to ever. And live. he was right. Easily. Lars <laughs> So He's Lars on. is so far in my life creatively. Guys named Lars, two for two. <laughs> two you know? for, there's only two on Earth. To the the the, the, the best Bad guys. A thousand, yeah. Loving both Larses out oh, there. Much respect, much respect. Um, so your first few tours with Rancid, yeah, occur around Let's Go. Is that correct? No, ninety three. It's before the so first three. Let's Go. You're before. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. I joined the re I joined the band prior to them while they were basically making the first record. Wow. And like I said, that was the question. Would I go down and do tracks or would I earn my spot? And I said, I'd rather earn my spot. Yeah. yeah. But Talking I was with badass. them through the whole process. I remember Tim going to Kinko's with the album cover, you know? Wow. So we made radio, radio, radio. That was the first thing I was ever on. That was 93. So, right. and that was something and, that was and very And Billy important. Joe co-wrote that song? apparently apparently he did i i don't know i mean that's but um hmm. uh <laughs> i i don't know okay. you know i i was never i that's we've never talked about that that's fucking crazy hmm. here but, we are for the first this is breaking news <laughs> yeah Be for me, doesn't know i remember it being talked about but i don't think it, i think it's like an afterthought you know it's not like one of those those things. Maybe he came up with the riff. I don't like he was know. jamming and did a thing that happened to make it, but it wasn't like a sat down to write I, that song type session. I, I just remember walking like over by where the green day house used to be me and Tim. And he's like, uh, we were talking about here it is. Here I am turning it up fucking loud. Like that part of the song, we were kind of having a chat about and what order those, wow. those, so Lines you worked shopped get. that out loud together, <laughs> just walking down the street. Well, we wrote we wrote Midnight and Nihilism. We wrote Nihilism on the steps at his house. We wrote Midnight or one of the international. I can't remember which one on the backs. And Saint Mary was. I, it's it's kind of foggy, but I would definitely tell you that like listed or. Junkie Man was written on Stormy Shepherd's steps in the front of her house. Uh, Listed MIA was written at the hotel, um, the Omni Hotel in Detroit, Michigan. Fuck Excuse yeah. me, not Listed MIA, Lock, Step, and Gone. Like there's certain, uh, um, um, uh, As Wicked was written in the van before we actually played somewhere in the in the Midwest somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like I remember, because we used to write songs this was back in the days where we would write songs in the van and then practice them at the show wow. like because there's nobody filming you know it was all let's try nihilism you well know? i've been oh. wondering and that brings us to an, a very important topic like let's go and out come the wolves are one year apart yeah and I, I i can't fathom how a band would do that now with infinite ways to demo songs let alone <laughs> And that's like you're you're touring songs. all the time and still manage to put out like your this breakthrough phenomenon one year later. Well, we the thing about it is is that we were always had guitars with us. Um, we would, you know, when we'd be home in between tours, we would be together writing songs or hanging out, getting burritos or whatever the fuck it was, you know, and we were just very prolific. We were just always ideas, you know, ideas were coming, you know, super fast. Um, and I remember when we did let's go, like we only had the studio for three days and <sighs> Tim knew Michael Rosen, Michael Rosen had like, um, had done some pretty kind of big records at the time. Yeah. And, um, he worked at fantasy studios and, Tim knew Michael, maybe it was the thrash connection. Cause everybody kind of knows each other. Maybe it was sure. Rob Flynn or somebody, mm. you know, I don't, cause I think Michael worked with violence at one point and then Rob and Tim, I know were, were pretty tight. 
and maybe that's just bay shit bay yeah just, <laughs> yeah just bay shit bay you know and, yeah and so we went into the same room that credence did all of their recordings fuck yeah and it was and we just we had three days and we just banged it out Smoked. everything vocals too we, three days for vocals everything oh it was like we, we we just because but we were also like it was there was so much intensity and there was so much like um drive and passion for what we were doing you know and we would just come up with it you know and it would just kind of come in and come out and we just put it down and like a lot of those songs maybe you know took 15 minutes to form you know just because yeah. it was like let's put that there, there, there. And, we, and we you know we just the hardest thing sometimes was the lyrics you know just because yeah. you had an idea about how things would go or whatever and mm -hmm. But you just kind of went in there and did it. And then Brett Gerwitz mixed it in three days. And then it came out. And it, and I remember Salvation was half as long right. originally. It was a minute and 30. And, and Brett cut it and made it twice as long. Doubled it? No just doubled it. Doubled it. Really? Yeah. So that, wow. yeah. So that's how that song came about. And that came about in the mix. He's like, this song should be twice as long. So... And that was the first song that really got us any attention, you know? Right. And that's that's a huge hook. Big time. And that was like... One that of was the a last... mixing audible called. <sighs> yeah, that was one of the last songs we did. Tim says, I got... Because we always call it, when we go into the studio, we call it, we're going to do demo days, which is basically now we're going to... Now that we think that we have the meat and the potato of the record, let's try some new ones mm. and see. And a lot of the times, like... I just think if Outcome the Wolves was put out without Little Sammy's a punk rocker, um, uh, uh, 11th Hour, uh, The Way I Feel About You, um, Daily City Train, and uh, Disorder and Disarray. Like, those five songs were done in the last day. Wow. Disorder and Disarray is, like, top three for me. Me too. That's like yeah. one of my all-time favorite Rancid songs. But I just think about the record. What would the record be? Because there was other crazy. tracks, though. We we had other tracks. Um, yeah, it's twenty. So the with the the like deluxe version is like twenty-one songs, right? Yeah. I would think it'd be more like twenty-eight Holy because Lord. little little rude girl, which ended up on a bastard's record, and Lady Liberty were written in nineteen ninety-four. Wow. So Lady, we tried them both, and, and, and Lady Liberty ended up on Life Won't Wait, but it used to go like, it was more like a, like a, like a, like, like that. Lady Liberty, come down and blame me on nothing to do with your crazy, like it was like a, like a, like a, like a more like a rock thing, you know? Yeah. And then when we took it to Life Won't Wait, we were, we were sort of like, let's just do something completely different because we've tried it all these times and it's never seemed to, to make it, so you know, let's try it like a little more rockabilly, psychabilly kind of ch okay. shit because we love the, uh, the Meteors and Mad Sin and Man. all these other bands, all the psycho bands. Let's try it like that. You know, isn't it, it crazy not... how that works when you can try the same music in like a different font and then yeah, somehow yeah, that right, just yeah. cracks the code? I mean, I, when I think about how many songs have either been Scott first and turned into mid tempo punk or fast punk or vice versa, like there's been a few. Um, mm. over the years, you know, let's what talk was about, the biggest, sorry, you go ahead, Bo. <laughs> I was gonna say, let's talk about, I want to talk about touring at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, like the actual, uh, when I first started touring, we had printed out map quests, which mm -hmm. would have been a luxury when <laughs> for like mid nineties, right? Like that would have been, yeah. you would have probably loved that at the time. So yeah. was it wake up from wherever you are? atlas map to where you got to go reach a payphone and call a random number that you got well i gotta give it up to matt freeman because matt freeman wiped me up an hour earlier before everyone else so i could do my charge my hair <laughs> wow so i would so and that was part of his schedule because matt freeman took the reason why we're all still alive <laughs> Dude. I gotta you know get the I mean? coffee. I gotta re I gotta look at the map. I gotta wave up Lars for the, for yep. the Mohawk, and then I gotta exactly. schedule lunch. And then, wow, we had the maps. You know, we the, the the road maps, and we had Richard the Brody, and him and Matt and Brett. They me and Tim didn't have driver's licenses at the time, so Gangster. they did the majority of the uh, the driving. 
so it, it was all up to Freeman. And this is before like cell phones. So like you, it, right. you, you would be going, you know, we would have merch sent out and it would be sent to a place and then it, maybe it didn't get delivered. So you had to go find the UPS and then, you know, there, there was a lot involved in there or whatever. But Matt Freeman was the guy who literally would take a map, plan, plan the course of action, and then wow. we would get there. And, and but, I mean, later on when we had tour buses in 90, 95, like, because we had did like 20, uh, no, it was over 20 tours just in the vans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, and then when 95, 20 tours. Out come the, out come the wolves kind of happened. That's when everybody's like, well, we can have a bus now. I love kind of happened being the descriptor <laughs> of like this breakout fucking like the master killer of punk kind of <laughs> happened. <you know>? well, <laughs> I, I don't, I really honestly think that like when we were making that record, we didn't, we didn't really, we didn't know, like you never mm. knew. And I don't think that cause there was, that was around the whole major label stuff when all the major yeah. labels came courting. You know, and me did, and Tim have, did uh did Madonna really send you guys naked? Yeah, pictures? you should have told me. I would have had the photo with me, and I would have shown it to you, um, because it's downstairs. But yet, no, she what she did is she had she was making that sex book at the time, so yeah, it was like yeah. a Polaroid, and she sent us a letter with sealed with a kiss, and and then it was like a Polaroid of her bending over a chair, so you can kind of see the the silhouette of her stuff, and it's right. signed with Maverick, and then she came down to. Wow. see us when we played the roseland and she bummed a cigarette off me <laughs> and i remember our foreheads kind of touched Ooh. together when we were because she was lighting the cigarette off <laughs> um she was she was super nice she treated us with respect you know yeah she was cool um that's but a yeah, cool yeah. way to court a band to your label yeah and but i mean we <laughs> obviously obviously we didn't do it but yeah, it's like yeah. but, but I, I think that at the end of the day we wanted to I don't think the outcome of the wolves that everybody hears now mm -hmm. would have been if we signed with a major, then it wouldn't have been the same record because Absolutely. I think we would have came in way harder. You know, it wouldn't have been as personal either. Mm -hmm. I think we probably would have, we probably would have switched gears a little bit. So Epitaph know? really emphasized let, letting rancid be rancid. Yes. Um, that was, I mean, Brett knew like, he knew how to get the best out of us. That's why we've only had him as a producer. Wow. Um, Love that. So it's like, he knows what to say to me. And he, we, we've known the guy 30 fucking years. It's like, he knows how to get the best out of us. It's like just him being in the room. It's kind of like, he's like your dad and you want to, you want to show dad that you've been, you know, you're doing your homework. So he yeah. takes you to Disneyland, you know? So it's <laughs> oh, like, yeah. hell yeah. That's what I think we have this, looking up to him because we love him so much and he's and he's really like you know treated us like in a lot of ways i think brett looks at rancid as he's in the band and rancid looks at brett as he's in the band sure. he really is that close to us because he helps with everything like he'll say you know do this do that and then you go that's a large part mm -hmm. let's do this and then oh, large wow. you go blah, blah, blah or whatever you know wow. like whatever you know, he'll always bring something to the table and he listens to us. So and he share, he's like an insider who share, who provides an outside perspective as well. Yes. That's and, invaluable. And, yeah. and he will tell you when it sucks, you know, mm. the only time I ever got mad at Brett is when we were doing, um, uh, let the dominoes fall. And I, the song damnation, um, I'm doing all downstrokes and that's like 180 beats per minute per mm minute. -hmm. And to do all that downstrokes and then to get everything right. Timing wise, yeah. Johnny Ramone style. And I mostly do downstrokes, just not really that fast, but like, yeah, that's, that's... like yeah. I did two perfect. Cause I, I'm in the studio. I'm kind of, I, I am not bragging, but I'm kind of a one taker, right? Like nice. I kind of can play from the start to the finish. There's not punching. I kind of know what I'm doing, know where to go. I just, I, for whatever reason, I have a photographic memory when it comes to that stuff. Mm. But I did two perfect takes and Brett was on a phone call oh. and he came in and he listened to it. He said, let's do it again. I said, there's no way I'm fucking doing that again. And he goes, what? And I go, Brett, I'm not doing that again. And I stormed out of the room. 
I've never, cause it was, it was super hard for me sure. to do it twice in a yeah. row. Mm. And that's the only, perfect. I do. There was, listen to that fucking thing. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it's on the snare. It's like, it's perfect, man. There's no cutting of that. That's just me live, you know, down. And, and, and I, and it's whatever. And he's like, Oh, okay. Okay. I'll listen to it. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> so like, I think he was just distracted with the phone call and just yeah. wanted to be part of it. But like, I, I don't know why I got so hot at him. I don't think he deserved it, but mm. I was just, I was well, so Brett, if you're listening, he's <laughs> Lars, Lars feels remarkable. I'm sorry, yeah. but you know what? Brett also, you know, gave me $500 when I was having a really hard time back in the early days and I couldn't pay my rent. And then when I was able to go pay him back, he didn't even remember that he had loaned me five hundred dollars. And I said, "Here's the five hundred dollars." He goes, "What's this for?" I go, "He goes, nah, dude, keep it." I go, "No, no, I pay back my debt." So, like, Brett's that type of guy too, you know? Sure. Um, but, what uh, were the, so? Speaking of touring, yes, you know, let's go. Out come the wolves. What were the holy shit moments? Yeah, you know? yeah. those 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 tours had to those like there were several instant evolutions size wise what were the moments where you were like yo this is fucking crazy like the tours uh the shows the, the interactions with people well for a year and a half we would i was home for about 23 days total okay oh. so that's how much we were playing Ooh. we would do six shows and one day off normally like a monday and yeah. that was normally a drive day yeah sure Sometimes it would fall on a Sunday, but you'd do six shows in a row, one day off, and that's the long drive through Texas or whatever. Um, there, there was a few occasions, I think, that we were so caught up in just doing the gig. Mm. I don't really recall. You know, you would see things grow. You weren't taking it for granted, nor were mm. you expecting it. Sure. Sure. But it, you were just so caught up in the the momentum of it all that there wasn't really a time to stop. And okay. it wasn't until after that you really – I mean, touring with the Ramones and Metallica and Lollapalooza, that was a big fucking thing. You know, getting my mom out of Devo's dressing room was a whole – you know, that's like some tri trippy shit. Like, <laughs> not, not that she was doing anything inappropriate. but No, that's awesome. San Jose, um, Spartan Stadium, Lollapalooza, my, my mom's first time seeing Rancid perform. Wow. <laughs> uh, it's us, the Ramones, and Devos playing on that show. And I had to go do some press, and I'm with the, I was with the Ramones in their dressing room. It was me, Marky, and Joey, and my mom. And they really liked my mom. They had... Um, my mom really wanted to re meet them because of the rock and roll high school. She knew that me and my brother, oh. you know, who are these guys? Yeah. And Marky's and Joey were class, you know, Mar Marky's still classy, but Joey even class, it just as classy. And I said, Hey mom, I got to do some press. Let's get out of here. Marky's like, don't worry about it. Just leave her here. We got her. We'll take care of her. What time do you play? We'll bring her up <sighs> to the stage. And I was like, you know, blah, blah, blah. That. So <laughs> anyways, I go back and, uh, they used to put the Ramones and Rancid at the, like they would big, like build like a camp. Yeah. And the very furthest away dressing rooms were always the Ramones Rancid and the Ramones. Because you guys were fucking. We were punks. Hounds or what? <laughs> yeah, we, no, we, no, we were just, they, 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 we called it punk rock jail, right? Yeah, because yeah. you had Soundgarden and Metallica <laughs> and whatever. And we would laugh about it. But, and so I leave my mom with Marky and Joey. And I go and do the press. I come back to the Ramones dressing room, like in, you know, 45 minutes later. I go, hey, where did my mom? Oh, she, you know what? She dipped out to go to the bathroom. She didn't use that terminology. She left to do to go to the bathroom. And I and I said to come back, but she she she's gone. And I'm like, what the fuck? So I'm going, <laughs> I'm looking around. And then finally, the last place I look is Dio's dressing room, Devo. And it, it, it was really weird. It was a long kind of building and they were all at the very end of the building. And I see the, my, I open up the door and I see my mom and she's got the back to the door and she's doing this with her hands and she's explaining and she's doing a very good job. It's like, she's, you know, got this thing and they're all sitting there cause they're in their yellow suits and the, the hats and shit because they got a <laughs> full on hats this. on bro. 
Oh, she's gimmick. cutting a promo on Devo in full gimmick. In their gimmick. Full gimmick. Yeah. She's a gangster, and, dude. <laughs> and she's she's and they're very engaged. And and uh and I go, hey mom, come on, man. man you, don't bother Devo. We're about to play. Come on. You, you don't gotta bother Devo. And I swear to God, Devo stands up and they're all and they're all like, no man, you leave. You, you're leaving her here. You're leaving. You're leaving. Like, oh my God, I'm getting this right now sorry mr mother's ball by evo because yeah. they would rather hang out with my mom but anyways that was like one of the things that was kind of crazy right amazing when you think about it um you know i remember meeting lemmy for the first time and i had a, a rose tattoo tattoo and i said i got a rose tattoo tattoo over here i'm gonna get motorhead over here and he just looked me in the face and he goes then you better get acdc on your navel and I was like, okay, that was pretty powerful. Yes, sir. <laughs> so he told me to get it. But I remember when I first met him, he said, he said, I said, hey, Lem, I'm a huge fan. And he goes, name one song other than Ace of Spades. <laughs> wow. And I, and I said, Metropolis, Bomber, Overkill, Chase is better than the cat. He goes, all right, all right, all right. And then he was super cool. And and I think that like, because, you know, a lot of people knew about Ace of Spades or whatever, you know, yeah. when they think of Ace of, you know, I mean, what not a bad song to be remembered for, but no, no. And, uh, but yeah, so meeting Lem, I met Weird Al Yankovic, which was pretty cool. Oh, my man. Um, <laughs> yeah. You're you know, a Weird Al guy? Lawrence? Yeah, fuck yeah, bro. I love Weird Al. Another so, one for the fucking Weird Al army, brother. The there Saturday, are millions of us. There are yes. 14 of us. Yeah. <laughs> Saturday Night Live, I think, was the big thing for us. I think that was because wow. Fear had done it. Yeah. The specials had done it. Elvis Costello had done it. You know, that's um, the, I, I've said this before, but the first thing I ever YouTubed ever, was like fear. when I found out about YouTube was fear playing SNL. Cause I had yeah. read about it and I wanted to see like all the, all the dudes in the, ground. there's no harder lore than that. Yeah. That was done in DC. Really? That was, that was filmed in DC. It wasn't in New York it or if it was, York. or if I'm correct, uh, Roger Merritt needs to be here for this one. And if you ever have them on, you got to talk about it. It's either it was filmed up in D.C. or it was filmed in New York and they brought a bunch of heads from D.C. That, yeah. That's, that's the, my recollection is that yeah. D.C. rolled deep as fuck. Yeah, that's what it was. Now. That's what Ian it was. He grabs I, the mic and says New York sucks. Before York that's, sucks. Yeah, yeah I, I feel like that's 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 what it was. Yeah. OK, so but yeah, so that was a big fucking moment because you kind of go now you're on TV right now. Yeah. You're. Like you're on Saturday Night Live, dude. Yeah, that's, like that's that's like you know, if you do anything in your life, nobody can no take one, that from you. Then and like you know, not, not everyone knows what Lollapalooza is. Everyone, especially at the time, everyone knows what Saturday Night Live was. Yeah, and that's that's the, that that's oh, oh shit moment. I mean, mm. there's been a few. I mean, obviously, I feel like unfortunately, it's like pro wrestling. I've forgotten more than I remember mm. at this point. But I mean, remember seeing Rob Halford on the side of the stage watching us play, or Bruce Springsteen watching us play, singing along to one of our songs. Really? Or, oh my yeah. God! Bruce seeing, knows like, words to yeah. rest words. I turned God, around. Good fucking great job, dude. <laughs> I turned around and he's singing. I saw him mouthing the lyrics, and then or like the, the Brian, like Brian Setzer and Slim Jim watching us. That was that's pretty dope. fucking rad. Yeah, that's fucking cool. And. Uh, he, Brian sets her love gunshot that song Matt Freeman song off, okay. off let's go um you know just little things like people that will come you know out of your wheelhouse like you just don't know it's like whether it's actors or professional athletes or professional wrestlers or yeah. you know guys that like I kind of maybe looked up to like you know it's it's just trippy when they say hey you know your music affected me or or you know whatever it is it's 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 still kind of a trip because yeah. you know the way i i don't really see myself like that and at the end of the day it's like for me i'm just like i'm dad and um <laughs> and i'm i'm stoked on that you know it's like i i really enjoy my life now like you know i i've joined many bands and you know i've been I played so many goddamn shows. I love that, but it's like, you know, when I think about that, the music that I've left behind, 
I don't, I so I sometimes don't realize how much of it will be left behind, you know? Oh my God. It's you're gonna you're in a, a permanent time capsule buried for the aliens, brother. <laughs> Ransom will be in the first thirty five bands that they hear. I guarantee. Yeah. Well, well, that's the thing. It's like with Ransom, like that wasn't never the goal. Like if we we thought this is what we really honestly thought. If we could be like Bad Religion and be able to kind of go play eleven hundred seaters, a thousand seaters, or whatever for the rest yeah. of our lives, that's great. Like that's that's huge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's all. That's all we would want, you know. Other than Metallica and, and Slipknot, that's pretty much metal's ceiling now, you know. Right. But whole... we're, yeah. I mean, and but we're fortunate that we, you know, we can go out. We can do bigger places. We still have somebody that wants to see us. Yeah. I feel like we've sort of moved past this thing. I mean, we've been a band now, and Lemmy told me that he goes, "Once you're a band for 25 years, and you don't take any breaks." people look at you different. And I think that's really kind of what's happened in a little, in a way, you know, for us. Well, a few years ago, you just played Brazil for the first time, right? Correct. And Correct. how many people were there? Ooh. <laughs> uh, well, I think the biggest crowd was one, 120,000 or something <laughs> like that. So it's, but that was also playing with Metallica too, you know. So you got to, yeah. Know. But a hundred, that them one hundred twenty thousand was watching Rancid in that moment. Yeah, so that's I mean, all that it, matters. It, it's it's pretty trippy. I mean, the whole thing playing Madison Square Garden with the Misfits that was something that was like, fuck yeah, that's a bucket list because that's the biggest North American punk rock show ever. If you think about mm-hmm. it, like I would love <laughs> to talk about the Misfits with you. Okay, so I'm I'm like a huge Misfits fan. I'm a big mm-hmm. dancing fan in general. Yeah. And I know you're, you've, you said your stance on Motorhead and the impact. I would like to know your opinion on the Misfits and Danzig's impact on like American subcultural everything from art to music to. It's everywhere, bro. It's fucking everywhere. It's like if you really think about what they've done and they didn't even have to be a band the whole time to do it. Yeah. Just had you know to make I mean? a fucking sick logo. Yeah. I mean, the Crimson Skull, Crimson Ghost or whatever, like, I mean, that's iconic. It's everything about that band is iconic. They were doing that thing before. I mean, if you think about punk rock, what it was back then, how it accepted everybody from Gigi Allen Mm-hmm. to crass yeah right it's two polar opposite ends of the spectrum one singing own us do they owe us a living the other one saying fucking i'm gonna butt fuck you or whatever yeah, like yeah and all everything one in thing, be- you know yeah, yeah but it, but it, and everything that is in between all that and the misfits being included in that right it's like there i love them i can't say that i go through periods with them they're yeah. like one of my period bands. So it's like period bands. But um, they, they <laughs> like, I'll have like a couple months with them and then I put it down and then I come back and then I put it down. Yeah. And um, I love Glenn Danzig. I love his voice. I think his solo shit is fucking killer. I love Sam yeah. Hain. Mm-hmm. Um, there was points when I wouldn't say that I was the biggest fan, mm-hmm. but, you know, as time has, has sort of kind of come and gone and stuff like that, today where we stand like i love glenn danzig singing <coughs> singing elvis oh yeah. it's insane he, it's he picked a crazy level. track list but a yeah. couple a couple uh heaters on there for me that i'm uh i was psyched to hear it's a crazy yeah, track list it is yeah, i wonder but, if I it's mean, a licensing you, thing or i feel like it's just like a um slumdog yeah. millionaire type thing yeah. like these are the <laughs> these are the songs that that hit him in a certain yeah, way yeah, yeah. fair yeah. enough fair enough so, so yeah, obviously, not, go ahead. Sorry, no, 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 go ahead. I want to hear what you were going. Uh, uh, we know your stance on punk, you know. Yeah, yeah. We know, we know your the impact you've made in the genre. I know firsthand, yes. you love a hard ass riff. I do. I I want to hear about Lars's take on the hard ass riff. What's some hard shit that people would be like, "Yo, Lars, fucks with that." That's crazy. Like, do you hear suffocation and you're like, damn, that rocks, you know? Yeah, it's mostly by Gary Holt. 
Mm-hmm. He's uh, after like Hetfield. I think he's my favorite extreme guitar player. That's fair because he's got swag and he's got all the riffs. Like he's Bro. got both of them. It's so sick. He's a riff machine. Yeah. yeah. He, he, see, I love anything that is heavy, weird, out there. Doesn't care if it doesn't matter if it's got corpse paint, long hair, short hair. Doesn't matter. Like it mm-hmm. does not matter. As long as it's I feel like I've listened to music long enough now I can kind of tell the authenticity behind it. Yeah. So there's some stuff out there that I'm kind of like, eh. It might be a good riff, but meh. You know, the riff like, is only half the battle. The the intention right. is everything. Mm. But you take a guy like Gary Holt or Kerry King. I mean, I love, see, one of my favorite bands is Cannibal Corpse, right? Mm -hmm. I love Cannibal Corpse. Now, can I listen to Cannibal Corpse for three hours during the day? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Can I stay for a whole death metal show at age of 51? No fucking way. It feels like my liver is going to fall out of my asshole, (laughs) right? Sure. But when I want to go grab that sound i'll go to cannibal i'll go to death i'll go to you know a lot of the shit there's a lot of really new good thrash stuff mm-hmm. like i go to ba- I, i'm on band camp a lot trying to discover new bands you really um, are man i i didn't i didn't know this about you but like there's there's torch bearers of modern music in the world and like uh, like uh, Trevor from Black Dahlia was one he we just mm-hmm. he just sadly passed yeah. Max Cavalera is a big one mm-hmm. Lars you're you're kind of the 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 number three like <laughs> purveyor of new music you're out there going yo listen to this well I feel like that's you know I you know I might be 51 years old but I think what's kept me young is being in touch with like what's happening in the modern world of music. Yeah. Cause I mean, if you meet me, I don't think you're going to go, Oh, that's that 50 year old haggard guy. <laughs> like that's just not who I am. You know, right. I like young energy and I, yeah. and I like what, like when my kids bring home their rap music and Wolfgang will get into the shower or I'll go upstairs and blast his shit, whether it's Yeet or fucking playboy Cardi or whatever the fuck that he's into. Yeah. I'm always tuning in, kind of going, what's this dude talking about or or th- this the rhythm or whatever. And it's like my ear is always going to engage with it. And it's yeah. so it's a, you're a and, musician. How can yeah, you not? Yeah, of you course. Know? But I also really love when somebody loves something like that. Like Wolfgang really loves that shit. I mean, I used to take him to go see Creator and fucking shit like that, you know, and Metallica. And he and then he's like, you know what? I want to try this over here. And then he goes here. And I go, hey, do you want to go see fucking exodus at this fucking bone he goes yeah let's go you know so it's like he's still you know will dabble in it sometimes he's been saying more no than yes mm-hmm. recently but sure. you know but that's but that's his age he's 15 so he's discovering his own thing you know yeah. and that's he's gonna rad. turn 18 19 and be like oh dude my dad you know my dad is actually like <laughs> <laughs> well here's what uh, my I dad got, it's funny i have to talk to my little guy about something when he gets home so I don't want to get completely lost, but like, <laughs> so, but creator and mostly like the later, like Millie Petroza is one of the guys as a guitar player, songwriter, singer. Like if you see how much that band has advanced from, you know, the very first like EP, you know, I have one of their demos upstairs cassette. And it's like, when you see like, the progression and how melodic it is now and how it's like this presentation. It's like, you wanted a buffet? Well, here you go. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like, it's insane. Like when you take a record like Phantom Antichrist or, or, you know, uh, Coma Souls or some of these later records mm-hmm. um, and you really listen and tune into them, you know, it's like, he it's just it's symphonic in the sense that it's like it's something complete it's a reinvention but it's yet still creator right so Mm -hmm. uh bands with a lot of history you know and and i feel like that's like creators like that band that like i've got like five creator t-shirts 
Mm-hmm. I can't say that I have five. The only other bands that I have five t-shirts from are like GVH and Motorhead. Like that's mm-hmm. it. You know what I'm saying? So that's how much I really kind of go to them. I I do have five cannibal shirts. I should say that, but like, I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. It absolutely does. Um, and I guess on top of that, we, we like to talk about our Mount Rushmore's mm. In, mm. in the genre, you know? So mm. for educational purposes to those listening, what would you say is the Mount Rushmore of punk? And then on the other end, the Mount Rushmore of straight up hardcore. Mount Rushmore like al- and punk. by albums. Oh, by albums. Oh. Yeah. So, so four. Yeah. 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 <laughs> GBH city baby attack by rats. Social Distortion, Mommy's Little Monster. Wow. I'm going to throw Motorhead in there just because I don't think that we would have had this sound unless with them. I love them. that. So Motorhead, I would give it up to Overkill, that record. I love that. And then if I had to pick a fourth, I would probably go with something like, uh, I'm trying to think like, Last resort, skinhead anthems. Mm-hmm. Those are probably skinhead the, anthems. Because I mean, that was the, that was God. that was the first skinhead record out of England. You know, I mean, that's what a lot of the hardcore guys got. That, yeah, right. and that wasn't even supposed to be a record. That was a demo tape for the record. That and the guy from the Last Resort shop out negotiated the record label and ended up putting it out, pressing it um, without the band knowing. Wow. Whoa. So, because that was just the demo tape. That was the demo tape to get them into the studio to do the real record. Wow. wow. But if you think about that sound, that was done on a fucking four track. Yeah, that's insane. You know, and just to get that, and it's not even. So, and another thing I found out that kind of broke my heart: the leads on that on that record are actually the engineer. Really? Oh, shit. Yeah. It's it's not Charlie Dugan. I think was the guitar player at the time. So that's a and little like tidbit. leads on that, like influenced Bro. years and years and years of records. Bro. So on the new last resort record, we did freedom part two mm. and my leads on that are just an extenuation of what I heard on that. And I didn't find out about it was the engineer until we were on tour. Unreal. <laughs> wow. You know, so, and as far as hardcore, you got to give it up to AF. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I would, you got to give it to Victim in Pain. Agreed. Pearl Mag's Age of Coral. Uh, Madball set it off. <sighs> and I would probably, you know, I got to, you know, if we're talking about past, right? That's kind of where my mind is. Mm-hmm. But um, what would be that fourth? I would, you know, I'm going to be biased. I'd say Powerhouse No Regrets because that's awesome. For West Coast, that was a big deal. You know, even though Chris is from New Jersey, it, but it took that like, you know, this kid who used to smoke dust and listen to Flair and then Ernie and Eddie from Oakland, fucking straight hood Oakland. Yeah. And those guys coming together. That's what made it so special. It's kind of like me joining Rancid. I feel like that chemistry happened. I'm from the South Bay. These guys are from Berkeley. It was like a it was like a crash you know, of, mm. of different kinds of things, you know? Mm-hmm. So beautiful. We have oh, a, tree. another question that we, that we like to ask is True. who do you do? So when you, even, even in the beginning, um, when you were on stage and maybe it's changed, maybe it's changed now when you're playing and you're singing, mm-hmm. whether, whether it's obvious or not, who are you like trying to embody? Who are the three, two, three, four guys where you're like, they, they subconsciously created what, who Lars is doing on stage. Stage Lars. Ric Flair. <laughs> Straight up. That's so good. Straight up Ric Flair. Um, That's the first wrestler answer we've ever had. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ace Freely. Yeah. Badass. And, uh, Lemmy. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I feel like, you know, it, 
that's what I would want to be. You know, mm. if I'm doing that, I don't know. But I really <laughs> honestly feel like the reason why I'm the one talking to the crowd. But yeah, those are the guys I try to embody now, whether I'm doing that. But I feel like I was always kind of the one to talk to the crowd. I'm literally thinking to myself, dusty promos, yeah. flare promos. Like, <laughs> how do I engage and bring them in? And I think, honestly, I learned so much from watching pro wrestling about how to engage a crowd. I don't know if I've done my job well enough or not, but my, like Brandon Stanekert always goes, dude, you know, you're not a punk rocker or skinhead, bro. He goes, you're a pro wrestler trapped in a <laughs> punk rocker skinhead's body. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like hey man, dude, <laughs> you, you know? So it's like, that's the way I always want to want to perform in, in that sense, because I feel like you have to give people, even though rants had, we kind of go like seven in a row talk, and then we blaze through because we do like 26, 27 songs yeah. in an hour and 15. Exactly. So, you know, you're getting a lot of music in that time frame. It's like when I go play with Stomper, we're playing an hour and 20, but we're only doing 16 songs. I'm like, how the fuck is that? Like, because there's a lot of breaks in between, right? Right. So, but with Rancid, it's, it, there's a flow to it. And we like to keep the energy up. So, you know, what I have, when I get a chance to talk or communicate, communicate with the crowd if it's not like a, a, a guitar problem or something like that i have to feel i i feel like it's i have to engage them bring them in to what we're doing quickly because we're about to sure. get going again you know and i think <laughs> i that, got eight more for you real quick so how you doing yeah. um speaking of um like you said one of them was lemmy just yeah. something i've always wondered and wanted to ask you actually lemmy has murder one he's got or you know, had murder one had like the the amp, the bass, and and like his particular setup. At what age did you figure out that you could cut the Marshall logo to say Lars? Okay, that wasn't even me. That really? Figured that out. No, we were doing some stuff for Rancid. I want to say it was maybe two thousand Rancid two thousand. So the the, the self titled. And we were in the old rehearsal studio, which was now, which is now a recording studio where Michael Rosen has a recording studio. And I think we were there to either film all the videos for the songs. Cause we, we did a video for every song on Rancid five and Brett Reed was sitting there and he had, used to have a lot of these car parts because Brett, he liked to build cars and he was sitting on a case and he was like eating like a cliff bar or something. And then all of a sudden, I'm like sitting there. I'm just kind of tooling around. We were waiting for something to happen. I can't even remember. He picks up a razor blade and he goes to my amp. I'm like, what the fuck is he doing? Right. And he just cuts it out and he cut it out and he goes, there you go. So Brett Reed actually figured that out. That's awesome. What did you, what did you do in that moment? I thought it was fucking rad. Like I was like, <laughs> unbelievable, <laughs> dude. I go, I go, can you do the same thing to the other one? And he goes, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and did it on the, on the other one. So now, like, it's kind of a thing. Like, when I went over for Stomper to do the videos for the new record, because our new record's coming out pretty soon, and, uh, like, they knew to get me a Marshalls and to, and to take tape. And, nice. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. it's kind of now, now a thing. Has Marshall uh, acknowledged that? Probably not. I don't think Marshall acknowledges anybody, but um, <laughs> let me see what I can do. <laughs> okay. Well, I, well, I, well, I just like, I love um, artifacts. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I love these, like, like do the, I think Sammy from goat horror has the love like, Sammy. He, he has the, the Hanneman rain and blood guitar. Right. You know what I mean? Like I love these, like, Oh, it's like Lord of the Rings shit where it's like, where does this yeah. item end up? And yeah, where know? does that helm? Yeah. Yeah. You know, end up, you know? Well, and Gary, you know, Gary Holt knows this story, but one of his Schechter V's, the blood splattered ones yeah, got taken and then it ended up in, it got taken from him and then, but got to me, but he does know the story. So yeah. I have one of those V Schechter's blood oh, splattered cool. ones. So, he he's accepted that. that, that he's that's accept your, that's, well, I sent him now. I sent him one of my camos, and he was using ah. it as a backup. So that was pretty rad. And I got that's a video of him playing it. It was pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Let's. Uh, I'm sorry let's, to sorry to cut you off. Oh. No, you're perfect. You've never done made a mistake in your life. Um, <laughs> let's wind this down with the okay. classic 
hard little yeah. question. Yeah, we got some. Okay. Yeah, because we're big. We're big fast food guys. Fuck yeah. As all touring musicians kind of have to be. So when like this, let's say you're not. You don't have. There's no catering at the show in this in this scenario. You got to eat before you get there. Rancid is flying down the five south. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a, a mystical sign that shows all the like food here, exit here now. Yeah. What's you can, it's anything. It's this, anything. This was, doesn't this matter. Is a magical Region, exit on the five. Time, okay. nothing matters. What's the one thing where Lars and Rancid as a whole are like, yo, pull this fucking bus off the freeway. We're eating here. Taco Bell. Yeah. <laughs> it was always Taco Bell. And the reason why is because Taco Bell had vegetarian options. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Because their beans were vegetarian, right? There was no lard in the tortillas. Right. So you could, and I remember Vegetarian Times, which was a magazine back in the day, put out a whole article about Taco Bell and how it was vegetarian friendly. And you could even do vegan there mm-hmm. because they wouldn't put lard in the beans. They wouldn't put lard in the, in the, the, the tortillas and these things. And... But Taco Bell was always the place because it's cheap, right? Yeah. Everybody could eat. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes you wouldn't – I mean, w- when Rancid first started, we would we would go into – since I worked at Togo's, we would sometimes stop at a Safeway or some sort of Piggly Wiggly or whatever the fuck sure. it was. And what I would do, I would go into the shopping center – and I would get a brick of cheese, lettuce, tomato, white bread, mayonnaise, mustard, Wait. and maybe some pickle relish. Lars, are you telling was. me that you were the rancid in-house sandwich artist? I was. And oh, so no. what we would do <laughs> is I would make sandwiches for everybody on the hood of the van. Wow. And that's what we would eat. We'd have cheese sandwiches. And I would, I would, you know, because I was always like, mayonnaise has got to be perfect. Or who wants mayonnaise? Who wants mustard? Blah, blah, blah. Some people don't want it. I want it dry. Okay, get it dry, whatever. So, like, I would, I would, and I would always get like a thing of icebergs, some tomatoes. Yeah. Um, we always would have, like, the first stop we made, we bought some of those plastic forks and knives and shit, mm-hmm. just so we always had in the van. And you could, one thing that you could count on, you could count on plastic silverware and cartons of cigarettes in the rancid van. Like, you knew. <laughs> No, that you were going to get one of those things for sure. And then that's what we would do. I would make them sandwiches because we lived on basically $5 a day, yeah. you know, and you would, you were buying a pack of smokes and then sometimes, and then if you pull your money together, then you could, you know, buy a loaf of bread or whatever. Wow. So, you know, yeah, you, but like your, your resume is already <laughs> extensive. <laughs> and now you've got, now this accolade that you're telling me the sandwich <laughs> artist. Are you a soda guy at all? Um, I used to be a Pepsi drinker, but I don't, as I've gotten older, like I don't really fuck with too much shit just because um, you build up intolerances as you, you know, progress in life. And I feel Mm. like for me, you know, uh, for a lot, for the last, you know, there was a reason why I think I uh, joined 10 bands. I was in a very unhappy marriage for a mm-hmm. long time. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, part of that was, was like eating terrible too, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, have over the last couple of years, I've, I've just removed a lot of things out of my diet. Then I kept in just because I just feel better and I want to feel better because I have sure. to show up and be dad and I have to show up and, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm engaged to be married again now. And it's like, congrats. Mazel. Thank you. Yeah, mazel. And she's also 10 years younger than me and wants to have more kids, which I'm, I always wanted. So it's like, it's perfect. Right. So, I, you know, Does I she drink I'm, soda. No, uh. she actually, dude, we got an air fryer and I got to tell you, it's a game changer. Yeah, oh, it is. It's fucking a awesome. fucking game changer. <laughs> and she cooks most, most nights, you know, cause she loves that's part of her, Love language, I guess you want to say. That's cool. Yeah. That's what a fucking gift you've got then. Bro. Oh, my and, God. You know, the kids love her, and that's important. And, I mean, we've been together about four years now, but she's just – she's really – she's a very loving human being, which I've never really had in my life. And I feel like uh, at this point, at this stage, like 
I'm sincerely at a place where I truly do not care anymore. I don't give a fuck. And I think part of that letting go of a lot of these things has made my life actually that much bigger, you know, and I'm able to be more present and I'm able to be more accountable. And, uh, I, re- I only do things that I really enjoy now. You know, it's like, yeah, this was yeah. something I knew I was going to have a blast with. Right. And did you have a blast? I fucking had one of the best times and I hope we can do a part two sometime. Cause oh, I know that there was probably a lot more that you guys wanted to talk about. And we kind of always goes. Yeah. We went, the we scratches went. has merely been the, the what, <laughs> what the scratch has <laughs> n- merely been surfaced. Barely okay. Been surfaced. We're doing this, gray. Yeah. I love how you put that. Was it was yeah. interesting playing word, words. <laughs> well, Lars, yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah, no, I'm please, please, God, continue as long as you want. Oh, um, well, you know, I wish I could, but now I got my kids blowing me up. Yeah, saying, come pick me up from school. So. Let's no get your kids. Um, wow, I'm blown away. Lars, yeah, you're the man. You. Thank you so much. This was great. My thank pleasure, guys. Us. We cannot wait to do this again, which is inevitable. We will. We, we Lars, pro- Lord, too. Coming soon. Uh, Lars, thank you so much. Thank you all for listening. We love you so much. Listen to Rancid. Listen to Lars and the Bastards. Old firm fucking casuals. We go way back. Uh, Ruckus and old firm casuals. So That's right. Yeah, you know, it's whatever. But yeah, thank you, Lars, so much. Thank you all. We will see you next week. Bye. Bye.